Okay, welcome everybody. I'm gonna call the December 7th Land and Shore Issaquah, Issaquah City Council Land and Shore Committee meeting to order. Happy December, everybody. Um, introductions, I'm Stacy Goodman, uh, chair of the committee, and to my right is Mary Lou Polly and a Winterstein, too. And to my left is uh, Keith Niven, De Development Services Director and Economic Development, is that right? Okay, you wear a couple hats. First item on our agenda tonight is a moratorium update. Good evening, um, Keith Niven, Director of Economic Development and Development Services. Um, uh, tonight, we're gonna start the agenda off by talking about the moratorium update. Um, last time you saw this slide was in September, um, and just uh, to update where we're at on our six work items, uh, architecture and urban design was at the council on the 4th um, and is coming back to the council on the 18th, uh, so I updated uh, that timeline. I, I'm, I think staff and the administration is still hoping that the council will um, adopt the architecture and urban design manual on the 18th. Uh, we have finished parking, uh, affordable housing. The housing strategy work plan has been adopted by the city council, which identified nine different housing strategies. Um, there are two that we ag agreed to move forward this year. That's the multifamily tax exemption and the inclusionary housing requirement. Um, both of those, uh, one of those was at the council, multifamily tax exemption was at the city council on 12-4. Um, it's coming back on 12-18 and uh, inclusionary zoning is on the land and shore agenda this evening. And we'll see what happens with that. Vertical mixed use is finished. Um, and then visions, uh, district visions is also on the land and shore agenda for this evening. Um, and we'll see what we do with that. Uh, the 18th is a um, moratorium hearing on the council agenda, and the reason for that is because uh, what the state statute says is every six months you have to have a hearing to decide whether you're going to continue it or lift it or amend it, and so we have to do that on the 18th um, because our six month cycle will have run. Um, so that will be on the 18th. It's the extent of my presentation. Okay. Any questions for Keith? Okay. Thanks. Second item on the agenda, Agenda Bill 7503. This is a short plat and boundary line adjustment regarding a city owned parcel, which was formerly referenced as the King County Island parcel. Looks like we have Jen Davis Hayes here. Hi, good evening. Um, so tonight uh, we'll be talking about the short plat application that we um, are putting through the city process. Typically short plat uh, application doesn't come through council, but we wanted to make sure that this information, because one, we own the property, and two, it's very integral to a couple of other projects that um, this council is talking about, so we wanted to make sure we present it to council and um, get feedback about it and, and make sure everybody is aware of this. So we're looking at um, presenting information today and getting authorization to move forward um, uh, with this uh, short plat and boundary line adjustment. We anticipate to go back to council on the uh, 18th. So for those of you who are not aware, where the um, King County Island or uh, former King County Roads property is, this is a, an aerial view and you'll see, so this is the Issaquah Highlands and Swedish Hospital up here. This is I-90, uh, this mouse is not very good. And um, <clears throat> we purchased this property last June 
and um, we annexed it. It was actually effective on November 16th, and we're going to be here today, um, and then hopefully full council on December 18th, and if we are able to proceed, we'll uh, process the short plat. So again, this is just about the short plat process. Uh, the zoning has already been placed on the, on the parcel when it was annexed. So as an overview of what the short plat, short plat process looks at is um, typically when a d uh, property owner comes in for a short plat, they also have a development proposal uh, in line or soon after. Um, we currently do not have any development applications in for these two, for these uh, parcels. So we are merely creating the parcels. At the time that the application for development would come in, we would then look at what standards are required for that parcel. And um, legal access is one of the things that is provided to all parcels within the short plat, so that's a requirement. So an overview of the parcels there, we are looking to create four parcels of this property. And can I ask you a question? Yes, can you go of back course. To legal access? Yes. So legal access is provided to all parcels within short plat. You said that's a legal requirement, and it is. Is it currently provided now? to all of those? Well, right now it's one par parcel, so yes. Okay, so when it's when the parcels are created, will there be legal access then to all the parcels? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, just a clarification, because um, I don't know if this is what you're thinking, but I'm trying to be clairvoyant tonight. So we're creating <laughs> two development parcels and two open space tracks. Okay. There does not need to be legal access to the open, open space, space tracks, because they will be remain in forested in perpetuity. So what are the two parcels? So when you when you describe them, you can tell us where the legal access is. Sure. So um, currently, so th so as Keith mentioned, there are actually we're creating two parcels and what are called two tracks, and so um, labeled here. So number one um, again currently has the IC zone zoning on it, um, and you can see that road Southeast Six Seventy Fourth Street. So that is the the legal access there. <laughs> Um, track number, track, which is number two up here, is um, the uh, open space, and we own actually the prop. The city owns the property to the uh, north of this parcel, so we can actually access from the north. Um, we are also in conversations with purchasing this property from Washdot for a reservoir, so we would be able to have access from both locations. But currently, the access, if we need to go in and maintain, would come from our own property to the north. Parcel number three is community f uh, facilities parcel here. Um, so there is access from this road name. Sixth, Sixth thank you. So this is uh, West Ridge South, correct? Development, we'll see an aerial of this parcel um, in a minute. And then track four is right here. Again, it's open space track. And there is um, right away access from here, but, um, and there's also a trail that goes along here. <laughs> Any questions about, um, and it lays out here, so the, what was estimated, so on this on this map was what was estimated, and these are the actual numbers of the size of the lot, of the parcels. It's a, the, par, the original parcel side, size was just over 20 acres. What's the difference between a parcel and a tract? It's a legal definition. <laughs> and I'm gonna call in a friend for anybody who wants to, a planner would like to answer that question, but. Are we? Because I'm looking at the legal description. So do we have one legal description, two parcels, and then we have tracked with tracks within parcels? Sort of. So tracks will have their own legal description, and they will be encumbered as open space. But they're part of a certain parcel number? They would have their own parcel number. They would not be part of another parcel. Question, Jen. A parcel three, seven oh seven point oh nine acres in the table and six point six on the figure. So yeah, so these numbers um, were from the map. Sorry, I used a map from the from the annexation was an estimate at the time. These okay. are the correct numbers. <laughs> and you may remember when we did the annexation we were still looking at um, where exact lines were gonna go but we've done surveys and been out there looking at um, slopes, et cetera. <clears throat> Any questions about this? 
Okay, so that was interesting. Now you made me think of another question. So <laughs> why, what did you see that changed it from 6.6 .6 to 7.09 that had to do with slopes or, or anything? I guess why did it get changed? So what I will show you. Oh, if you're going to get to it, don't worry. Yeah, so, um, and this is, um, so for that parcel, we are actually also doing a boundary line adjustment. And so that accounts for some of the difference. So what I did was, and this is in on the short plot plan you have, and what I did was cut and paste the, um, the new parcel size over what you saw on that map. So originally that map looked like this. We are looking, so this is the original uh, line across. Again, we own, so this is an aerial. This is a parcel that the city owns. This is the detention pond here. Um, and so we are looking to create uh, the part, the boundary line adjustment to here to allow for, as you can see, it's, it's sh kind of shaded here, but it, there are no trees here. And so that will allow us for fuller tr tree retention at the bottom of the parcel um, <clears throat> by adjusting the boundary line up instead of going farther into the open space, which is um, <clears throat> to get to the, to, for, the, for uh, this, par uh, this parcel. So why not just add that space that's treated to the um, community facilities open space 3.68 parcel instead? Adding? Take it from one and add it to an open space parcel. So there's a portion of a utility tract being added. Mm -hmm. Why not? Why did the, did the CF open space that is to the south of that also grow then by that amount? It did. Okay. That makes sense. Yep, so it grew uh, 3.6 to 3.74, yeah. Yep. Thanks. So again, part of this application process is to do the boundary line adjustment and that information is in here. Any questions about the boundary line adjustment? Okay. Actually, uh, one question. Oh, yes. How many feet uh, north is the adjustment? Yeah. Um, I do not, I can find that out. I, I might have, I cut and pasted off of this item. I can find it's out. It's like, it's somewhere between 40 and 60 feet. Yeah, it's it's not, so basically, it's not gonna bump into this road. So this road will maintain here, so it's right in here. So I can find out the exact feet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Jen, was there any adjustment to make it a more buildable parcel because of steep slopes? Did that come into the discussion at, about what size it should Throughout be? Throughout this process, we, we were looking at that. So, um, because I don't know, you know, this, we, when we originally were looking at this, at these sites and, and where the lines were going to be, and so you may have seen many iterations of maps <laughs> along the way, and so that's why I used the latest one um, for the annexation, um, but, but we definitely looked at where the steep slope is and not p providing uh, sp space from what we what considered we consider should be an open space into this into the CFF parcel because we want to ensure that they have enough to, you know that there's an opportunity to develop if that's what you choose in the future <clears throat> okay and and then what I, I mentioned um, typically if you uh, we recommend to proceed with this administrative review and approval, um, and if so, we would then process the short plat and boundary line adjustment in December and January. And I just wanted to remind, uh, as you probably do know, that uh, we will be back to talk about the two the two parcels then. So this is not the only time that we will be in front of council talking about the details. This is more of an administrative creating the, the parcels. One of the things, especially for the, the transit-oriented development, but also for the CFF site, um, for the IC site, is that um, for the TOD project, they need to get a um, appraisal on the land to determine the value between that and the other uh, location, um, and they can't do that until there's an actual parcel, to, you know, with actual lines. Um, but we will be back in, in front of council. Um, we anticipate in the first quarter to talk about the more details about that project as it's connected to this parcel, as well as with the school district. Um, we'll be uh, talking about uh, property acquisition um, in the first quarter as well. And again, that's a discussion. It's not a decision made yet. Other questions? <clears throat> um, okay. Does anybody in the public um, have any comments you'd like to make? Sure. Ron.
Good evening all, uh, my name is Ron Fall and I serve on PPC. I'm here tonight as a citizen. At the time that we actually create these parcels, we have to put some, I believe we have to put a zoning on them at the time. Uh, I recommend that parcel three be uh, zone as CFOS for open space. Uh, I'm adamantly for that recommendation because when you are looking at this parcel from the freeway, if we were to put a school there and to cut those trees down, even though there would be some buffer, you would still see the building. And not to say that some of those trees would die, then you would actually have a very terrible site. And we are already at the point where we're cutting way too many trees down. So uh, my recommendation is that that classification remains as CFS, CFOS. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? David? Um, it would be very helpful if we actually knew where those boundaries are, if there was some flagging and some staking from corners and maybe mid, mid, mid line on that 700 foot boundary. It would be very helpful to know what, what we're really talking about here in terms of view, view issues. Thank you. Connie? So it seems like we're creating short plats for specific uses that may or may not happen. And so for the upper parcel behind Swedish, it could work just as well as a city park so we wouldn't have to buy a city park in the exact same area that is showing a park deficit. So I would like to know how this lot line uh, Commitment is would work just as well if we were to use it for a different purpose other than the school district because this seems limiting for um, what you're doing right now. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Last call. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I uh, was able to phone a friend uh, regarding your your question, Paul. Um, it's 64 feet. She was able to read those small print. <laughs> okay. So one of the questions was about the zoning and putting zoning there. Mm -hmm. And so um, can you explain that the zoning Sure already been yes so the zoning was uh, defined and discussed during the annexation process and so that is not under consideration of changing at this point as part of the short plat process so the lower parcel uh, again, during the annexation process was zoned um, IC. The, the parcel number two and four were zoned as CFOS and parcel three was zoned as CFF. So that is not, not under consideration at this time. And as far as adjust, adjusting the boundary line adjustment um, and if there's a decides to be another use, a city park, whatever it may be. Um, we own <laughs> either side of it, so it's not really going to change um, any, I don't believe, any use or any ability to do a park there if that was uh, the city's decision at a later time. What about flagging and staking? So I'm assuming that there was some sort of a survey out there and there might have been some uh -huh. stakes. Yeah, and I'm not sure um, to what extent they're still there because this was um, done a little while ago and I think the school district may, may go out and do some things. So um, I think the issues that were um, brought up uh, by the public about staking, um, that's really more relevant during the um, next phase or the phase after that. So as you, if, this, if the council were to decide to sell that piece of property for a development, whether it be for an elementary school or something else, what would need to happen would there need to be a SEPA analysis done of that, which would include views? anesthetics and so all of that would be part of that. If the council wanted that to be understood before they made a decision on on relinquishing that property to another buyer, um, that work could be done as part of that purchase and sale agreement. Um, 
as would additional geotech evaluation of that property would happen way before anybody would want to buy that property. So, so there's, um, there's probably some legwork before you guys get a request to buy it um, because somebody wanting to buy it would want to know what they could do there. So, so I guess my, my long answer, which was not intended to be, is I think that would happen at the next step. So the, um, so particularly the extra 64 feet, that's, that's fairly new information about um, extending. I mean, we knew that, that that was being thought about. Um, and so I would think that, you know, as a property owner, and we're supposed to be responsible for the city-owned property um, in terms of just fiduciary responsibilities. I would think that it, that not waiting a few months down the road, um, when there's even you know more and more and more investment in looking at this property, I would think sooner rather than later, we would want to stick some sort of flags out there. There's got to be something out there, stakes from you know the survey. Um, I don't know that it has to be done tomorrow, um, but I don't think that it's a I don't think it's a bad suggestion at all that, you know, one of seven of us might want to go out there and look at it. Okay. Just kind of have an idea of what we're talking about. Really? It's a question um, and comment. Um, when you talked about the next steps, which would be the short plat passes and then there's an interested buyer, lots of different things happen. All those additional expenses, such as getting it surveyed and all that, that's done by the purchaser? Typically. It's not additional city So resources. we would, um, we would probably, um, what we would pay for is we would probably pay for an appraisal. Um, because we would want to know that we got a an appraisal we could trust. Um, not to say that we can't trust the potential buyers of either of those two properties. I was not implying that at all. <laughs> um, but we would that would be an expense that we would take. But otherwise, um, whatever due diligence a potential buyer would do would be on their nickel. Um, and then as far as uh, closing costs, those are typically split 50-50 but that's also negotiable. Okay. And then for Jen, thanks for bringing this to us, even though it sounds administrative, because it is tied to a whole bigger story out there in the community, mm -hmm. so it's good for us to know it. Um, I understand that we can look at aerial figures and we can move lines around, but I would assume that a staff person actually walked this piece to assume that it truly is buildable and not just the right size piece, but somebody went out mm -hmm. and said, yeah, okay, mm -hmm. perfect, mm -hmm. awesome, thanks. Yeah. And as a clarification, um, bringing this to us, to us, it was my understanding that this had to come to us. It, it, Right, had to come to the council As because the city owns the property. You are the property owner. Yeah, so well, we have to make comes. we okay. have to make a decision. Okay. 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 All do you have any questions? No, I don't. Okay, so um, there's two questions. One is whether the committee recommends moving it forward with a recommendation. Mm -hmm. Forward. Not. Yeah, support yes. moving forward. Okay, and then the next question is when. So. Um, so it's returning to the full council on December 18th, um, and the planning calendar has it on the consent agenda. Which, oh, it does. Yeah, yeah. surprise. Um, so um, I would like to see it on regular, just because it's been talked about a lot, so the public could see the next step in the process. Um, and so we can do that, put it on the, we can put it on the 18th, and then I would like your feedback because 18th is shaping up to be a, a monster of a meeting. And so... Um, timeliness. Hmm? Does this have to happen in December? Time. Yeah, so does it have to happen in December? Um, I think probably no. Um, but we could also put it as the last item, and if we have a long meeting, we can move it to January. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll be there for another topic. Um, the uh, So the whole thing of moving forward with the process for both the TOD project and the um, what happens on the upper level. Um, as far as with the TOD, TOD I know they're, they are waiting for this parcel so they can actually go and get an appraisal, which then can have a continued conversation with CenturyLink, which, so every, every delay in, even if it's a couple weeks, kind of kicks things back even farther, so. 
Um, while um, I can't say that it will kill the project if we don't get it done on the 18th, it's pretty important to kind of keep things moving. And by that time, we will have, um, and we've committed as a city that we're creating this parcel for the, T the King County TOD fund application and all these th steps that we've committed to doing. Um, and by that time, we'll have a, hopefully have a, an award from the King County TOD and they can actually start taking some next steps. Since we don't, we won't know about the award until mid-December, mm -hmm. it's hard for me to believe that three days later, if we don't have a parcel created, that it would kill the project. Right. So right. I'm, I'm fine with putting it on the 18th. I'd like it to be on regular. And then if we put it towards the end of agenda and we don't get to it, then it could be bumped. But I, that's I'm my... I'm fine with that. Well? I'm fine. Okay. I'm putting last. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jen. Yes, thanks. Next item on the agenda, Agenda Bill 7344, Central Issaquah District Visions. This is regarding the development moratorium. And Trish Heinen here is here along with Keith. Good evening. Um, so we also have about a dozen people in the room um, that participated in our last meeting from Planning Policy Commission to the Central Quad Task Force to staff and members of the public. So um, there was a, a lot of movement on these um, on the 30th when we had our meeting. I think there was a great conversation and um, I think that what we've put forward in the packet hopefully reflects those comments and uh, gets us to a place where we feel like um, we've satisfied the concerns uh, that the council had on the visions. So I'm gonna go through this tonight, um, and I think that, uh, I guess what I would propose to the committee, and I'll look to the chair for her opinion on this, is as we go through different topics, I don't know if you would like to pause at those topics and take public comment, kind of like what we did at, at Planning Policy Commission, but that allows for a pretty methodic um, walking through of this. So if that seems like a good approach, I'll do it that yeah, way. So, so I did watch the meetings and, um, and uh, I can just tell you that I, I just wanna say first of all, that I think PPC did a phenomenal job. I was very, very impressed with the level of engagement and, and, and the task force members who were there and also the public. I was very impressed with the level of engagement and um, uh, the comments were uh, helpful, thoughtful, substantive, and I just can't uh, tell you how much I appreciate all the work that you put in. So thank you very much for your continued work. And then I also want to tell uh, Development Services folks um, at this point in the year how much I can speak, not only for this committee, I'm quite sure, and for the entire council, how much we appreciate all the work that you have done. Um, it has not gone unnoticed that you have put in an extraordinary amount of work um, into the this year, mostly because of moratorium. And so that is not gone un unnoticed. And so I don't know what's gonna happen between now and the end of the year, but I think that um, Keith, you and your team, Trish and Kristen and, and, and Jen, everybody else, um, Jen for and Jennifer, um, everybody else who's worked should know how much the council really appreciates all the work that you've done, that your team has done. Well, thank you. And so as we have worked hard, you guys have worked harder. And so thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you all for your patience on this. It's it's been we've we've lifted um, the boat quite a bit. Um, and then you and I talked today a little bit about this. And so back to where I said I watched the PPC meetings. I thought it was very effective to have um, the comments come concurrently with the discussions, rather than wait until the end. And I appreciated the fact that you inv invited the public and the task force to sit at the table, mm -hmm. and that the chair of PPC did, and I thought that was a very, very effective and efficient move. And so if um, my fellow committee members don't object, I think that that model is probably a good one for tonight so that we can see if we, you know, can see what we can do. I think it's a very efficient way of moving forward to have the comments come as we're discussing. Okay. Okay. Okay with you guys? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great. All righty then. Here we go. Um, so 
to start with, this was a, a, a graphic I had with the Planning Policy Commission. And, and the, the point that I want to move forward, oh, by the way, before I get like further than toe deep in the lake, there's some extra maps um, and some extra copies of uh, the draft visions for anybody who would like them. Hopefully, there's, I didn't bring a thousand, but there's at least maybe a dozen sitting there. Because at some point, I'm hopefully not putting the document up. I can if I need to, but um, I'm going to be talking about it at maybe a little bit higher level. So if anybody would like a copy, there's some sitting at the end of the table. So the Central Issaquah plan, um, like most sub-area plans, is a composite of a bunch of different pieces. And there's guiding principles and policies and the district visions that we're talking about this evening. And then there's the development and design standards. And those, um, I wanted to highlight the fact that we've already done a number of things to tune up the um, development and design standards, including the architecture and urban design manual, the vertical mixed use of structured parking, and potentially the inclusionary requirements. So all of those are over on the left side of the chart, and really what we're talking about is the right side, which is the district visions. So this is kind of my brain dump on all the stuff that kind of we did. So, so the old visions, uh, the old visions is, is the first column here. It's basically there was a vision statement. It listed out the primary uses. It identified what was called the key environmental features, which included like the green necklace components. Um, and then there was mobility and connections. And then the new structure, um, there's a, a today description, um, and then a future vision. There's then the developer obligations, the city implementing actions, and then how we would measure success. So that's the kind of the construct of each of the what I'm calling the sub-districts. So, so the construct, we, we kind of uh, decided that really central Issaquah is a district. Okay, and so if you're going to then subdivide that district, you have then sub-districts. And from there, um, you, you get down into neighborhoods. And for each of the four sub-districts we landed on, um, really each one was it's going to be its own neighborhood, except for um, what we call the Issaquah Valley, which is pretty much the regional growth center. And then we divided it into two neighborhoods, Pickering and Gilman, um, one on the north side and one on the south side. And I'll get to that in a little bit. So so the kind of the, um, the elevator speech here, what we did is we reduced the number of districts from 10 down to four, all right? We, re we, are, rem we are recommending removing service, which is kind of over where Public Works Operations is, and Old Route 10, which is where BOMS and XXX is, are. Um, we evolved the visions to ensure that each would be livable, distinctive, connected, and sustainable. At least that was our intent. Uh, we provided a clearer picture of the green necklace. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then we tried to create a clear linkage between the planned visions and the future. In other words, the, the vision should give us an image of what we're going to get. And if, and if we can improve that connectivity, then that was definitely an interest of this exercise. So here's the, here's the new map. Um, here's the four sub-districts that we talked about. Um, I'm going to go into each of them at a, at a finer grain of detail a little bit later. Um, but here's basically the four areas. And then, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's the story at the beginning. And what the story is, is why are we doing this? Um, and it's really putting some information into the plan for why the visions went from where they were initially to where they are potentially going to go. And then the four sub-districts and the green necklace, you know, um, <laughs> there was, the green necklace actually is described, um, but not defined. There's no image of the green necklace. And so as we talk through the green necklace, um, I think most people can't really vision what that is. And so we tried to put a picture to it. Um, there was a lot of conversation about kind of, there's a whole layer of connectivity at a lower level down at trails and, and sidewalks 
sidewalks and other things, but giving this idea of this necklace and what it is intended to do, um, there was a belief, I think, from the task force and the planning commission that this, this would be a good thing to include. Um, in the visions. So with that, um, I think I'm stopping and pausing on the end of the first piece, um, and then we'll do each sub-district after this. So um, I think, you know, as we talk about, and I need to get my copy, I apologize. Um, so besides, um, besides uh, that, um, I forgot what my next slide is. My apologies. Nope, didn't want to do that. All right. So. Um, there was a there was a comment about um, the so the need for change, you know, and we, we we added so as we went through we started on page I'm going through the document now and I can put it up if would that be helpful if I put it up. What document? <laughs> what you're going through the. I'm going to go through it a little bit. Slide deck? It might be helpful. My. I wasn't quite sure how I was going to master this. So, okay, so. You have two of them in the packet. So I was assuming that one of them is, the second one is the. It's page 45? Yes. Page 45 of the packet. 14 page one. Because um, there's two of them. Four and after. So the, so the, the overall vision for Central Issaquah, we weren't actually asked to change that. Um, we were actually supposed to start a layer down. But as we talked about it, it was clear that there were definitely the need for, for some edits. And so one of the edits that we're suggesting is within the environment to add protection of wildlife corridors and healthy streams are essential to Central Issaquah. That was a comment that came up uh, repeatedly through our discussions um, with PPC and the task force. Another thing, when we talk about sense of community, what seemed to be missing, we talked about um, things like parks and plazas and pedestrian corridors. But neighborhood schools is also something that really generates a sense of community. And it was clear, I think, that that was maybe something that, sh that should be specifically identified in Central Issaquah. Because um, I think our vision is that as Central Issaquah grows, that there will need to be schools in Central Issaquah at some point. I ask that question, Keith. Sure. Just back up on those broad general statements. So the, the one on housing, um, adding housing to the area in a variety of types and affordability level, including new mixed use projects on existing commercial sites. So what caught my eye with that is that if we are trying to do, and I heard some of this in the planning policy as well, if we're trying to have housing and jobs, this looks like it puts a priority on maybe even removing commercial sites to just have housing. And then there was nothing in here in any of the other statements that said, we need jobs. So that's kind of, it kind of to me, and, and I go back to the PPC meeting where I, there was a talk about three potential projects. One, the removal of an office building for housing. And second, a removal of an office building for housing. And third, the removal of a warehouse for housing. And that, in an area where mixed use versus vertical mixed use could just mean is the market, that's what they want to do right now. We could just add a whole lot of apartments over the first 10 year of the plans and nothing else. And I didn't see anything in these big statements that talked about, it talks about being able to work. It doesn't talk <laughs> about being able to work in Issaquah. Yeah. And this whole mobility issue that we struggle with now already with congested roads, adding apartments only for a decade is just a terrible idea. So how do I read these and see that as we add these pieces in, we're not making things much worse before we make it better? Because the people that live here now and want growth that improves, not growth that makes things worse for a decade until the market changes and decides to build something else. Right. Um, so I have an answer, and I'm not sure you're going to like it, but I have an answer. <laughs> I think I heard so, you say it at people. Um, <laughs> so there's, um, in my, in, you know, as I as I see it, and I think as we talk about it, and and we can have a conversation about this because I think there's definitely some room for conversation. Is, you know, are the four areas going to be the four sub districts equal? in that perspective. And for me, I don't know that I think that Western 
Gateway is going to be an employment hub, nor do I think Confluence is going to be an employment hub. But you know, definitely for Issaquah Valley and East Lake, I think the answer is what you just mentioned is a concern. And so there is some language in there, and we'll get to it when we get to those dis sub districts, and we'll see if we went far enough for you or not. Because I have the same concern: is that we need to retain our employment because we have a we have an employment number we have to hit within the. RGC as well. It's not just a housing number, and housing seems to be doing fine, more or less, in the city, but you know, the, the employment number is equally important. Uh, just again, from that 30,000 foot level, when this came to the community, it was about the best use for certain pieces of land, and now we're talking about tearing down office parks, and I, I think that would be startling to the community to see Gateway come in on one side and then an office park on the other side over a 10-year period, building by building, come down with more residential. So we'll, we'll see about the, the mark. That's fine. Um, Another question on these, but I slip in my mind right now. Uh, schools. I know what it was. Schools. Schools. Yeah. So it says schools. It says schools. Um, and then that's it. <laughs> so I guess my concern is where, where does, in the vision, how do we actually get schools? Like if we're looking at 10 years of more apartments, does that tie into schools? So, um, you know, um, like existing residents with kids in portables now would go 10 years of more apartments. How does that help our schools? How does that make us better? Right. Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. Um, and I don't know if uh, Mr. Crawford's going to want to say something about that or not. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think, you know, so. If you if you think about you know the good news is with the Highlands we have like a great guinea pig in in terms of knowing like how many housing units result in the demand for like two elementary schools which is what we're hearing right now right and so that's 3,200 housing units or well we're at 40 4,500 so let's say 4,500 and we know the housing number that's projected for the RGC and so you could say wow well, okay yeah there's going to need to be some schools right and so well, the floor. Not you know, it's just a floor. It's, it's a not floor. even a max. Right. So right. You know. So I don't know, um, and we all know that land is hard to come by, and it will be in Central Issaquah. So you know, possibly one of the things that we need to put on our um, docket of conversation points with the school board next year is. How do we find land? How do we secure land? How do we reserve land within Central Issaquah, where land is going to be not available, um, you know, at some point for schools? So, it's one last comment on schools. Yeah, um, I don't. I'll do more on visions, but I really thought I would see in the visions something about a school. Okay. Like in a vision, <laughs> somewhere. So I have a number of comments, but I'm going to start in responding to what Mary Lou just said, and I'm going to echo that as well. I think within the livability sections of the various sub-districts is where we would want to call out um, the school element. Okay. The only place it's mentioned is in um, walking and mm -hmm. uh, to the elementary and middle school. Right. Um, so when I see it here on the... Um, in this first page, yeah, it doesn't reveal itself on the way I think it should later on. So we can we can remember to make a, uh, a point about that when we get there. Uh, and, be, and I have a number of comments about this page. And since we're opening it up, but they're not they're not too uh, not too long. But I do want to say too. I want to I want to echo what um, uh, Stacy and Mary Lou said earlier. I want to thank everybody from the public and the PPC uh, and staff um, and ex members of the Central Area Plan Task Force. Uh, um, I, unfortunately, I didn't watch all four hours of your meeting, uh, and I apologize for that. I will get through that, but it was incredibly, well, three hours and 55 minutes. Oh, well, there's two. Just three one, plus four. There's, there's seven hours. Yeah, the last one. I'm, talk, so I'm talking about the last one. I'm talking about the last one.
last one. <laughs> and uh, and um, but I've gone through this document in a lot of details, and I have I've come tonight with, prepared to make a lot of statements. And I and I from what I've seen so far, I think what I heard at that meeting is reflected very well in this version of the document. So I hopefully I will have picked up. I'll eventually get to hear it um, and uh, myself. But hopefully I've picked up that part that I have yet to watch. So so thank you to everyone for that. And I thought there was some really really good energy and some good insight in that. And it always helps to have have a few nights sleep, in this case, a number of years of sleep between the original uh, talking about it and then where it is today. And I, I just got to say, the very first one, Central Issaquah Vision, the very first one, um, um, as soon as you read it and you get to the word from, you go, wait, this is not how you start a vision. Right? This is this is our place to be aspirational. Aspirational, as if any place, the very opening sentence that says the vision is this is where we want to grab people. We want to grab the reader, and we really and, and so by talking about where it's from, it's kind of kind of mechanical. Uh, and so I I do have some suggested language, but I and I'm willing to. But I don't know tonight how much kind of wordsmithing or really what our I, I know we're. It says on the agenda, and our hope for, is to for take action tonight, perhaps hope for possibly referring it for approval uh, later this month. Um, and um, and I want to I want to try to work toward that. Uh, but when it comes to some wordsmithing, that would be probably the paragraph more than anything else uh, that I would think to. And I, and so I, and I'll, so I'll save further comments on that. Um, uh, should we decide later that you know that let's let's finish up the wordsmithing if we really do have some, uh, and then further on I, I wanted and, and so now I'm going to tack. It, it says the language is added protect wildlife quarters. So outside of the um, the riparian habitat along the streams, what wildlife quarters are we referring to? Um, and, and and if you need to phone a friend, that, that's fine with me. <laughs> Primarily along the, cri the creeks. Yeah, and, and so I heard a lot of the conversation. I heard that phrase, wildlife corridors, and I was looking at the map, and you know, you could get up into the park area where there's, a, you know, the the state park where there's a lot of open. But if there are corridors today and corridors that I think we're we are already planning just because of the creeks, it is that riparian habitat along the streams, uh, and and I. I find just the kind of the unqualified uh, wildlife quarters as somewhat, conf is it suggesting something I don't know? And I'm just hearing maybe not. And I'm wondering um, if there's some other language that could be more specific and putting that highlight about that habitat. Yes, uh, we can. Along those streams. I think we can do that. I think that's a good clarification. Okay. And then the last comment I have is, <laughs> is, and I've seen, of course, this many times, many years ago. I, I, I got stuck on the word innovation, and um, and uh, when you actually, it's the last one. And so, make a quick comment about this: is that um, that when you actually read what's there, uh, it's really about actions the city can take, right? to influence the outcomes that we want and saying being innovative. So it really feels to me that that is really, this is, this is a call for the city that we are going to invest to get certain outcomes. <coughs> and that's what I really feel that that one is a call for. It's, an inv it's invest for outcomes. Because we're not just going to have, obviously with land use and zoning, there's, we have a certain amount of control. But it's not just going to be all market everything. We're, we have certain priorities when it comes to preservation of lands and what we actual specific built environment that gets when it comes to housing as well. And we're going to make some investments. And whether that be, we're going to about to talk about inclusionary zoning. We know about the MFT, MT, MFTE as well. So I, I was kind of, uh, that's what I took this to be. So that's just a section, just, an, just another word I, or another suggestion I think that could add clarity to what the is behind that segment. And I think it actually um, runs consistent with the way that the subdistrict visions evolved in that there's now city implementing actions that's clear within each subdistrict. So we'll, we'll hit that maybe a little bit later. Um, so one of the suggestions uh, was to move this paragraph up towards the front. 
Um, so the need for a change was identi uh, for a change was identified. Growth must not just fit in with our existing community; it must make it better, and not be a detriment to the existence that exists within and adjacent to Central Issaquah. This is true during construction and after occupancy. This is sustainability in its broadest term, to ensure the new residents and businesses have gathering places and infrastructure provided to offset their impacts. So this piece, I think, resonated with the group. Um, I think it it um, responds to some kind of criticisms that maybe some of the earlier projects really didn't seem to be additive, uh, just seemed to be detractive. Um, and so this is up front. Um, and then uh, these items here I talked about earlier. Um, and we basically, uh, there was a little bit of uh, criticism that there was some duplicative uh, language and to try and make it more succinct and, uh, and to bring in more into this section, which was clearer and, yes, oh. So I watched the video, but it, it's hard when you're not sitting in the room to see if we were looking at and comparing packets. Are we seeing tonight the results of your edits after PPC, or are you telling us what the edits were and they will get included? These are the edits. These are the edits. Okay, so this thanks. is, this is, there's a few little red lines um, yeah, that I have where stuff didn't quite work. Um, I'll, I'll mention those as we go through. You talked about um, moving that paragraph up, but you didn't move it up. I did. You did? I did. Oh, I thought so you meant So it's now it like second. I couldn't, it didn't want to be first. So like here's, so we oh, have, so we have the CIP, we have the okay. CIP stuff. I have the need for change and then it comes. It was way down, down, down here. So it did get moved up. So, so, so Keith, yeah. I was a little bit confused by the paragraphs about need for change. Um, yes. So there's, there were, Two needs, two changes, um, overarching changes at different periods in time. One was the adoption of the Central Issaquah Plan, and then one was um, the changes that were um, that we're doing currently because we're not getting what we envisioned. And so um, I thought it might. Um, I'm not going to wordsmith, but I would have preferred to see those two distinct short par paragraphs. Um, I, or maybe even nothing about the Central Issaquah Plan, a little bit more distinctive. I've, um, but I'm, I'm not going to wordsmith it. Okay. I wasn't super crazy about that. Um, and I think the need for change was identified. Could be a little more, um, a little tighter. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry, Paul. Yep, yeah. No problem. So that paragraph that seems to have needs that you're referring to, you said it it, it, it needed to be yes. higher. I listened to the conversation, and I, I got to tell you, I I do struggle with some of the language in here. Um, and I, I I heard the passion, and I understand, I think, the source of of, of the suggestion. But um, after reading it a couple days ago, and then looking at it again today, I'm still struck. I, I think the phrase in there that not be a detriment. Uh, it's it's an extremely subjective thing whether something is a detriment or not, uh, and and if there's something more behind that, uh, maybe something more specific, but just to not be a detriment. What what could be somebody's detriment could be somebody's. You know, finally, guess what? That job I always wanted is going to open up next door. Right. And I don't think that was the intent uh, that to, to, to deny the opportunity that some of this change means for people. And so I don't think it captures what, I, I wish there had, uh, and maybe I missed it, there was more dialogue around that, but I don't think it really cap cap captures yet what uh, Stacy mentioned earlier and, and kind of um, some of the reaction that we've had to what, what it did already happen. So that's, that's my first comment. And the second one um, I, I do struggle with, this is true during construction and after occupancy. I think you made the comment there as well, but um, wow, you know, there's an, where there's an existing built environment to go through any type of redevelopment for there to be no impact um, during construction, I, that sounds great, but is that really <laughs> aspiring that during construction there's gonna be no, no, no impact, no detriment? I mean, that's, that's tough to do. And I understand, uh, yes, it's absolutely a hassle. Absolutely can be in a big way. But is that what we're saying, that during construction? 
So I think no he, impact. Or well, it doesn't say no. It doesn't well, say that. So exactly. what does it say? What does it say? Well, I not think, be a detriment. It, you know, I, it, it, so what this is for me is this is again we're in context we're still in visions, right? Mm -hmm. We're in visions about what we're trying to accomplish, mm -hmm. and I think if you are trying to accomplish that. Uh, you know, if, if the if the large lot house next to you gets bulldozed and turned into a four-story apartment building, sure, um, that's going to impact you. You're going to know it. But I think what we're trying to say is that we should do what we can to try and and make that as bearable as possible, right? I mean, I think, you know, we've already done a number of things this year by changing our construction hours, by changing our hall routes. I mean, I think we've already taken some measures along these lines. Absolutely. Um, I don't know that I equate that language to there'll be no impact. Okay, so so I agree with you. There definitely made some moves and, and maybe people want even more to mitigate the impact of when things are changing. But I think this also gets to the heart of what I think needs to be up there at the top of the vision because it's one thing to have a vision of, about the eventual outcomes. But what we're entering into is a new era in the city's history and there's gonna be transformation in an area that already exists. We're gonna be transforming this into a more livable, more economically vibrant, in a way that actually, you know, coexists really well with a functioning, vibrant, natural environment. We're going to go through a transformation to get there. And, and I think that's part of what we have to acknowledge, that there's, trans, there's transformation that's going to go on in this terms of, and some of that be redevelopment. So I think it's, it's, it's the, ask, the vision is, is good, uh, but there is, there, it's not going to be pain-free on the way there. And, and I had one, I'm sorry, no, one final one in there. And, and um, so the, the word sustainability, and I'm, I'm gonna make a couple comments about this throughout. Um, uh, I've struggled with how it's being used here and, it's, and my definition of it may be different, but I didn't really hear a definition. But m much of what's here is the word sustainability seems to be equated to something about the environment. Mm -hmm. And sustainability is that and some. It's, it's also your approach. Uh, it's, uh, it is, it, it, it's, about, it's about when you're in your course of living or making change or making investment, you consume and use resources in such a way that you're not gonna expire them for future use. I mean, you're going, you're gonna be sustainable within the resources that you have. That has an economic component, environmental component, many different components. And so then this, then, then this throws in its, a definition of it. This is sustainability in its broadest terms. And I, I, that didn't, to try to define sustainability the way you are wasn't um, just, it wasn't congruent with that, to me, the use of that word and how it's used later on. Use, I think use, later on in this document, a lot of it has to do with about environmental protections and the, and the respect and, the, and doing things right. Um, and so I'm gonna talk more about that as we get through in terms of the word sustainability. So I want to follow up with what Paul was, first, the sustainability. Um, I was, uh, we'll get to the next page, the livable, distinctive, connected, sustainable um, uh, part, and it was suggested um, that needs some work on those definitions, but, and I won't talk about those a minute except to say that I looked up the definitions of those four words, and sustainability was to support and nourish. Um, those two words, and so it can be to support and nourish many different elements, elements including the environment. Um, so I think to narrow it, to imply that it's narrowed to the environment, I think um, is an issue. But the need for change part, um, as I think about it and I listen to what Paula was saying, um, I almost wonder why we even need these paragraphs in here. So this would be, this page, this plan vision, would be replaced in the Central Lissaqua plan? Okay, yes. so, so I would see under, instead of here, just a, um, this section was last revised, it would be more, just like a fact section. It's a, it's a couple of sentences about the facts, and maybe it's three. It was last revised when, it was revised because, and um, I think, if, if things like the if things like that second paragraph are substantively important, I don't think this is where it, that belongs. Okay. 
So, um, well, did I skip anything? No, I don't think so. So there really wasn't much more conversation about kind of this part up until we get to kind of our four guideposts. Um, can I make a comment? So you can make a comment whenever Thank you like. So um, when I look at the list of what we use to sort of define livable, distinctive, connected, and sustainable, and then as I read through the plan, then we get to the boxes. I don't know what else we want to call them. I don't, I don't like calling them boxes, but they are, I guess they're boxes. Um, then we have more and more lists. This kind of says, in order for the, in order for it to be livable, it must be it must seamlessly blend, create a variety of housing choices, provide diverse employment opportunities. Those aren't necessarily true for each one of the areas, each one of the subdistricts, right? As you go down the list. So, after I went through the whole document and you know listened to all the conversations, I wondered if maybe we're trying to we're trying to um, do too much by creating our own definitions of these four words. So livable, is it worth living there? Distinctive, what are the uncommon and appealing qualities? Connected, parts and elements should be lo need to be logically linked together and sustainable. We need to support and nourish the elements that we want to be sustainable. So um, again, that was just, I just looked it up on in the dictionary and found those four words. And then each one of the areas is gonna have its own unique, its own features that make it livable, distinctive, connected, and sustainable. So plus one on that last part, okay. with a lot of emphasis. I want to add some more comments, but that certain level of commonality across the entire district, and then within the sub-districts, highlighting what may be distinct or specific within that area, all harmonious with the greater set of objectives. I, I, that makes sense to me. Okay. And I think I can see you're trying to do that, but I'll have some more specific comments to the wordage when we get there. Okay. All right, so that will take us. Well, don't move on too well, fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so do I. Go ahead. Oh, actually, no, finish. I'm, mine are, I have comments in general about all four of them. I'm not. Actually, they're 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 high level as well. Oh, okay. So just to be clear, so if you want to talk about how you feel about each one of those different ones, to be clear, I would take all of those bullet points out and I would make the definitions just a few words. And I would take all of these out because the way this is written, each one of the subdistricts needs in order to be livable, it has, it has to have all those yeah. things. Distinctive, it has to have all those things. That's the way this is written. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just those are just my own comments. So hearing that, I think what I struggled with here was I read all of these and they're, they're, they're nice words and they're aspirational things, but I couldn't link them to the neighborhoods themselves. And I also couldn't see when I looked at the districts or neighborhoods themselves, again, how the jobs piece is there mm. doesn't seem to be there. It says in here that we're going to create um, a variety of jobs. Well, actually, in the first few years, we're going to take down office buildings. So I, my big concern is that uh, these are nice words, but I kind of like them actually better presented as Stacy did tonight, more as definitions, because I couldn't see this in every um, district descript neighborhood description when I was looking at it. I mean, I don't disagree with the words. They're great. It yeah. just, I just didn't. Um, not sure they belong there. Yeah. Anyway. So I'm in general agreement with that that idea, and, and then, I, then I'm going to take another angle at this as well. I agree, uh, actually, quite a bit about the jobs piece, and in fact, I think it should be elevated to one of these categories. Um, it's interesting to me, especially when you look at all the sustainability details and the different. Um, 
uh, sub-districts and neighborhoods. A, a lot of them are environmental related. And you know what? A lot of them, and I think, I like, either we create a, uh, an environment section or just like schools uh, and proximity to housing and proximity to where you live and, and living uh, in proximity to uh, you know access to the amenities, the basic needs you need, such as groceries, for example. Um, all of those contribute to the livability of where we are. And we might want to consider those environmental features being or aspects you know, folded under livability. I just put that out for, for conversation. Because I, I do really think, um, I, like, I like the concept of distinctive, but I think there's, this, these, there, there's general um, objectives and, and uh, outcomes for the entire area that we seek. And then how, and then what is distinctive about each one of these neighborhoods or sub-districts uh, is, uh, I. Other, that, that should be perfectly clear, and I'm gonna have some comments about the details when we get there, but that should answer the question, why do we even care, why do we even have districts? This, this distinctive list or these unique characteristics of an area should be, the reader should be absolutely clear, why do we even care? What's, what's unique about this? Why do we care about this district? Um, so I think that's very important. And I kept going back to the word unique, but whatever, that's, that's wordsmithing. I think livability, I've already said some comments about that. I almost feel like we should bring in an economic component. Uh, because the economic component does talk a lot about the businesses and jobs. And guess what? There's going to be unique outcomes long term around the economic element to the different districts or sub districts. There's going to be, you know, I, we, we are planning for, like you said, in Regional Growth Center, by the way, there's not a specific ratio yet. The Regional Growth Centers do not have a ratio. There's a total number of activity units, right. which is your independent counts of jobs and housing units. Uh, there's, it's under consideration to maybe create a ratio, but that hasn't happened. Um, anyway, but still, we can have our own goal for. For, for jobs, for example, and I and I think that is very key on this one, and I feel that um, that might need to be elevated to one of these areas, and then in each one of them, we would talk about what about the businesses and um, and and jobs, you know, for this subject district and neighborhood. I think that's. I think that's pretty critical because it has a lot to do about even why we have a regional growth center and about, and to Mary Lou's point as well, one way that we can mitigate what otherwise would be, um, you know, uh, uh, we're on a trajectory of ongoing impact to our region by what's happening, what growth is happening uh, is in, in, in getting more jobs that, you know, pay sufficient for more people to live in Issaquah and work in those jobs is one way that we can bend the curve. I think it's, and this is, this is our opportunity to do that. And that's why I feel strongly that something around economic would be one of those others. And of course, connectivity or, or you say connected or mobility. Um, I do agree with that. But the, as I went through this a couple times, I kept coming back to what are the unique things? What's li what's, what about the livability? What about the economic? And what about the mobility? And I put the environmental issues into the livability. And, and that was my, that, and it works for me. I think it's kind of livable, gets pretty loaded. Because, uh, and, and so maybe there should be a fifth in environmental or what you want, if you want to call it sustainability, I'm not going to lose any sleep over that. But um, um, my main point is about the economic element. I think it should be raised. She just, uh, maybe a question for Keith. Um, you had talked with PPC a bit about how um, suburban commercial just isn't working right now. It may not work for a while, who knows. So we're talking about a plan that's 30 to 50 years long, but some of us will only see the first you know, 10 to 30 years of it happen or 10 to 20 years of it happen. So just based on that, I understand why we would want to write the plan for the build out at 50 years. The reality is, what do we, are we, what are you, what are we going to get with this plan if we just open the doors again with these visions? Are we just had, are we going to be apartments? Is that what we're going to be? Storage units and apartments and hotels? Is that our future? Is that who we are for ten years? Because if so, I think we have to daylight it and say that's what we are. So there's. Um 
this is where we get down to, when we get down to the individual dis sub districts or neighborhoods, there's a different perspective depending on which one we're in. So for example, um, I'm gonna take Western Gateway and if you take those, kind of, I think there's three single family houses that are used, being used for businesses and took those out and built um, apartments there or, or townhouses, you know, based on what we've written, that, that I think that probably would work because we haven't put anything in Western Gateway about, uh, I don't think, we haven't gotten there yet, but I don't think there's anything in, about losing jobs. But in, in Issaquah Valley and Eastlake, there is. So, you know, if let's take the Pickering Shopping Center and assume you wanted to take out PCC and build a five-story apartment building, build Atlas there, um, the way that it's written now, you could not do that. Because um, you, you could, could not. not do that. Because, and we'll get to the actual legalities of all this at the very end, um, or we can do it now if it makes sense. But at some point, I want to kind of explain how I think the mechanics work, um, and then y you know I think you guys will hopefully see how this might play out for particular projects. I think I want a little bit of that now yeah. at this level because I really feel like the community would be surprised if all we build for the next 10 years is apartments and storage units and hotels. I think they would go, wow, uh, not what we signed on for. So if that's it, then I kind of view all of this through a slightly different lens of, well, how do we get more than that or different than that? So if that's the reality, I'd kind of like to hear you comment about it now before we talk neighborhood by neighborhood. Sure. So, so what we were going to do also is allow the comment, allow the um, PPC members and public and task force to participate in the conversation as we go on. So we started with story, and then we went on to um, the definitions page that we are on. And then the next page is the green necklace before we get to neighborhood visions. So I'm, I'm thinking that we're going to want to um, ask for comments, certainly before we get to the neighborhood, before we get too far. Yeah. So uh, do you want to finish this page and then maybe green necklace and then ask for comments? Sure. Does that work for? PC members, and is that too far, or can you hold off that long? Okay, let's. So don't dive in for an example yet. No, I would wait. Let's okay. just maybe after that, or I don't think we're ready to do the districts yet. Right. The what? I don't think we're ready to go right. down into neighborhoods yet. No, not down into neighborhoods, but yeah. you would ask to talk about. Um, you said legalities. I'm assuming you mean code. Yeah. So. Um, so, so let's let's finish up this page. Do green necklace, and if you have something quick to drop, I can answer to Mary Lou's question, so we don't get too far without comment, then yep. that would be fine. Okay. So um, so on the green necklace. Um, Are you finished with the prior page, guys? On the green necklace, um, you know, what was asked for, and I don't know if I did a very good job, and maybe I need to get Parks to help me with a little bit of this. So, so what, I, what I think I heard was explain what do we have today um, and explain kind of where this is going and then give us an image. And I think this image is not complete. Um, I would add... Um, I can tell where the heck it is. Um, I would I would add the Mounds to Sound Trail out here, um, and I think uh, Mr. Kapler suggested the uh, Squawk Mountain connection to the south. Um, so we have I think a few more strands uh, to put on the necklace, um, but this was kind of an initial construct to start to show that there's kind of maybe an outer ring and an inner ring, and they're interconnected. Um, so, comments or thoughts on this? I one? agree with those comments, and the one that jumps out to me is the Mountains of Sound Greenway. Yeah, uh, and and obviously Squawk Mountain as well. But that one, I mean, they just should be in there. And as a, so it looks more like pearls than it did <laughs> in your version from last week. Uh, and um, uh, and so again, the conversation is really is really good. I know that there's the concept. Actually, until I listened to that part of the conversation. I wouldn't have said that the 
that there was a lot of detailed specific trails and locations that had come out of the task force. So that was informative uh, for me. So I appreciate the work that was done here. I have some higher level comments too, but you asked a question, I'll let the others respond. I'm like it a bit better. <laughs> yeah. um, the disconnect between the park strategic plan and this concerns me a little bit. Um, Mostly because, again, land's at a premium. This looks like a concept, and you need land to do all those things, and we don't have specific locations, nor have we yet seen the park strategic plan to say what the bigger vision is for the city as a whole. Um, so there's more here, but again, it seems more wishful uh, than I, I want to know that when we come out this time, when we come out from this moratorium, for example, I'll use Atlas, that the park that is built is accessible to the public. Atlas is not. It's completely surrounded and encapsulated by an apartment complex that faces inward that looks like it now owns a piece of the creek. And we moved a multi-purpose trail so that they didn't have to do a mid-block crossing and a multi-purpose trail. And we, now we've got the multi-purpose trail in the wrong place. I don't feel like we come out with this and the visions and we wouldn't see that again because I don't have the park strategic plan. That's probably an issue, but no more lost opportunities. I mean, coming out of this moratorium for me is about no more lost opportunities. So maybe if you talk to Jeff a bit and co-present this piece, it could be compelling, but right now to me, it still looks really conceptual and maybe we won't get it. And that, that really concerns me. I agree. I, I agree with both the comments. Um, I I like this, I guess I like this better um, than the first one, um, but it's still too cartoonish. Um, the green necklace is um, serious business. That, you know, <laughs> this is a major quality of life piece for this plan and for our city. And um, so if we wanna have, um, you know, images of necklaces on a map, then let's do it in some corner clip art. I don't think our green necklace should be an actual necklace. I think it should be a plan. I, sh I think it should show not only what we want, but what we have. We have a lot more than, this, than, than is on that plan already. I know that was a comment that, um, uh, I think uh, I don't, I, there were a couple of comments that were made. It was the it was a web. It was a a net. A net it was I don't know overlay. Um, but to to me, so separate from the cartoonish part, um, we have more than this. And so if I'm living in the middle between Tibbets and and where that Parks and Trails bubble is, if I'm living in the middle, it looks like I'm far away from everything, but we really do have connections all over this city, and I think we should show those, because they are great amenities. We've worked very hard to connect all parts of our city, even though we don't have the green necklace connected yet. But I agree, I don't, I don't think we have to have that perfect map of everything that we have um, to get out of the moratorium, but we need to get there soon. And I, but I also agree that we need to have, it needs to be linked to Prost and uh, the Park Strategic Plan and that we need to take this more seriously than we're taking it. This is not just a, this is kind of cool, it's a cute necklace. No, it's, it, this is a big deal. And I think it's time we take it seriously. So I have a question for both of you and then a question for Keith. Did, did you just say that, um, Stacy, your comments, you just talked about what it didn't need to be to get out of a moratorium, but did you just say that the park strategic plan integration and uh, influence on this section is required to get out of a moratorium? I, what's the schedule for pros? That's next year? I think they need to be integrated. I don't know what, what we have. I, I did not say that. I don't know. I don't know where we are with post. I think it's way next year. I think to completely, and if that's, am I right? Isn't that way next year sometime? No so the draft, yeah. you're yeah. gonna get the draft plan at the end of the year okay. um, with the idea that then the council and the community can 
have some time to consider what's being proposed um, and have some feedback opportunities before it's brought to you guys for adoption. So I assume that'll happen maybe Q1, Q2, okay. um, but you will have a draft plan, my understanding, by the end of the year. So I don't think, I think that the, that their central Issaquah plan and this map should eventually have all of our connections. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's, not, area plan. Yeah. it's not just this necklace that provides the connectivity and uh, allows the central area to be connected. We already have a lot of those connections. So let's, let's, let's blow them out, let's brag about them, let's, sh let's show them. Um, and I think we need to have all those in there. Um, Prost, not, I didn't say that we needed that. Was that was a question, I was just asking for yeah, clarity. Yeah, I didn't say that. Okay. And I hadn't thought about it that way, so I will. Hmm. I guess just thinking it through like I'm a landowner or a developer, if we come out of the moratorium and my property is ready to go, I have no idea what you're going to ask me to do looking at this. I actually, I, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't know what to do. I mean, the whole point is to come out and add some clarity. So this as a property owner developer, it doesn't clarify it for me that in, in my particular location, in my particular neighborhood, oh, they want a corner park for me. Oh, they want a plaza because on the other side of the street, they're gonna have this other plaza and at some point, all four corners of the plaza will connect and you'll be able to close it for an event. I don't get that from this. I don't know what I'm doing if I own that property. I don't know what you want me to do. So to me, I don't know that that, put, that, that puts us in a better, place. It's like, I give a lot of credit to the staff for everything they're trying to do. It's mm -hmm. council that approved the first plan. It wasn't fully baked when we approved it. We ended up in a moratorium and we're trying to get out. But when we get out, we need to be successful. And as a landowner, if I own something in East Lake Sammamish, East Lake neighborhood, I don't know what you want me to do. I don't know what... I have no idea from this what my contribution might need to be to make a great public space and a great private space on my property all connected. For example, um, the development agreement that was on Newport Way or on Gilman Boulevard for, I can't remember the name of the developer, but anyway, right across from Gilman Village. The attribute that we're going to get there is a tiny little piece of land next to the trail with a couple of picnic benches on it. That's part of our green necklace. Well, boring, it's nothing. I mean, honestly, it didn't, it, it's, it's a couple picnic tables on a busy road. That, that's, you know, I, if I looked at this now and I was in that same development agreement, I still wouldn't know what I'm supposed to do to make this work, to make this have a little bit of green space on my property for people who live or work there, connected to another piece of green space that's public that is part of this network. I wouldn't know what to offer you from this. And so that's my concern with it is that we come out and we'll get a bunch of picnic tables on funny little corner lots. And that's not much. It's not very exciting. I think it still looks like a, the, the map makes it look like a really fun idea, I think is, but I, I appreciate the evolution to where we've gotten here. I think we've got a ways to go. Um, how far we need to go before we lift, I think is the question. Okay. In the document, you can say that this is the first place where we start to talk about place, right? Even though, you, however you want to describe this, this is where we start to talk about place. And I think this place needs to come out even, I think it needs to be even a stronger statement. Um, yes, this envisioned connectivity, between open spaces and parks, riparian habitats, and trails on mountains is essential. But, but this is where we're talking about place, and I think, I think that when it comes to Issaquah uh, and our identity uh, and how we want this part of town to transform over the coming years, then this is where we cement how central um, our location is, its attributes, why people live here, and how we're going to make that part of our identity in the built environment 
as our part of our outcome. So as it, so I've been thinking about this for many, many years, and again, I'm gonna look, as I thought one of your comments early on, Ken, in the, it was, is that's what really grabbed me about this being potentially core. And I, I began to think that not only central, but I think we actually, I wanna actually elevate it a little bit more. Not necessarily just the green necklace, it's a critical element, but I think about who we are as, a, now we're talking about place, and we need to make a strong entry into, into this part of Issaquah, this district, uh, and, and what this place means to us now and what it's going to mean to the future. I'm also thinking, and you'll be able to appreciate this, I hope, that, you know, I put my LTAC hat on and we start thinking about branding, right, and and and, and getting out and some type of consistent wayfinding around. Um, and uh, we know from that Roger Brooks study that it's strongly recommended, and the council's going to hear more about it shortly, about, you know, there being some some type of brand and key identity. And and it began to really occur to me with, with the group work that was done to make this as preeminent as it is now. Um, I, what I didn't hear there, and maybe it's there later on in a part I didn't hear yet, but um, it just seems like something about us being a trailhead city in many different forms of trail, and it's not just you know hard pack uh, up a mountain, um, is I think we can, we're, we can start to capture here, I think this key identity that we're gonna not, that's not just for the central area, but I think it's our place within the region uh, and, and our distinct character that we are actually going to show to the world and talk to the world, especially when, when, when we try to promote, when we try to recruit the right kind of businesses, when we try to recruit the right type of events, when we try to just advertise who we are and attract families uh, that wanna live here, um, you know, because, because of all of this in the school district. So I think there's a certain elevation um, of this part of the story where we start talking about place. Anything else? This? Um, okay, so I think um, now for the first three, um, the story and then the next two pages, including the green necklace, who would like to provide some comment back to us? Ken. <laughs> Let me get back to the map, Ken. I don't know if that is a good place or not. Actually, you can leave that one up. You want this one up? Yeah. All right. Hi, Ken Koenigsmark. I was on the task force um, for the centralist squat plan. You warmed my heart and brought tears to my eyes with everything you were talking about, especially the green necklace. But your vision, your goals for the city, you're right on time. You guys get it. And the, Paul, what you described about this is the core of Issaquah's identity. It, what's, what's, it's what makes people want to live here. It's what will draw people. It will, it's what will draw visitors who will spend money here and then leave. Um, it will draw businesses here. All this is essential. All your comments, though, are getting at uh, a key concern I have, too, which is, as well as the PPC and the task force and DS staff did, it was a rush job. And we're 90% there, probably, in defining the visions, but there's refinement still needed, as you're all pointing out, in wording and uh, missing elements. Um, perhaps you can consider something like approving it with further tweaks to be allowed or something along those lines because I think there's more hours hours of work needed um, to get the wording, the key uh, goals, the, uh, dis, uh, the definitions, everything that we wanna get right, we get one chance now and then I don't want it to get tabled for another five years. Let's get it right and let's make it work. Um, but all the comments about the need to add more about schools, about jobs, um, about the, uh, if I can read my writing, the need for change, that whole paragraph, all that needs to be in there and needs to be in there really well. Um, so I would urge that this needs more time and more effort um, to be determined by whichever bodies you desire, but I'm certainly willing to invest more time in it as needed. Um, I do think, Paul, your comments about jumping right into this vision for Central Issaquah as we transform from strip malls, you're right. It's not 
inspiring. I suggested I think we do need a higher level vision right up front, which is the Issaquah vision, which leads into the central Issaquah vision. And again, something along the lines that says, we will enhance and sustain our quality of life for all Issaquah residents even as we grow. Something along those lines, you can tweak it. And then that leads into the central Issaquah vision, which is a part of that overall Issaquah vision. Um, Now I get into what I think is really important. Visions are great. We did a lot of work. This is growing into something really good. But visions are meaningless to a developer. We've got to have the codes, the policies, and the regs to back it up before, as Mary, Mary Lou is saying, we open the doors and someone comes in and they can look at this all they want, but if they're if the codes say, you can build just like Atlas did, we're gonna get another Atlas or three or four and we got to do better than that. Secondly, as all of you are saying, we've got to get a defined plan. And this is what I wanted to point out. If you look at this map, look at the green spaces that are already there, which don't even, by the way, include Confluence Park, which is buried under there. But if you start at Lake Sammamish, you go through the Issaquah Creek Greenway, connect up to Confluence, take the Maple Juniper Trail over to Pickering uh, or Tibbetts Valley Park, then along Tibbetts Creek back to Lake Sammamish State Park, and then the outer spokes to Cougar, Squawk, Tiger, to the regional trails. We are probably 75 to 80% of the way there in having this green necklace. What's needed is a detailed map to identify the gaps so we know specifically which parcels we've got to get an easement on or buy. As a member of the County Open Space Committee and Issaquah being a recipient of funds every year, I'd urge the city to apply for funds to get those key missing elements, the gaps that we need in the years ahead. Second way to look at this, right here. If you look at the green on this map, it, the green necklace is probably 75 to 80% there already, owned by the Parks Department, State Parks and others. Let's finish it off, but we gotta have that detailed map. So please keep up the good work. I, I'm liking everything you're saying. Thanks, Ken. Lindsay? Okay. Oh, and I just wanna let everybody know that we're, we're gonna continue on, so there are other opportunities to make, to make comments um, about other topics that we'll be discussing within this document. Okay, so Lindsay Walsh, PPC. I am gonna go to page 45. We have this already. We have an image that shows where we want to put our bike facilities and our natural paths and where we propose new parks and regional routes. This is the image that should be there instead of the conceptual green necklace. Sure, it can include some arrows out that say, this goes to there, this goes to there, this is how you get the connectivity. But when we're talking about the central Issaquah area, that's what this is. It's not the bigger green necklace that takes you out to farther areas in Issaquah. This is what the developers need in order to make their decisions in order for things to be enforceable. So I think that's already in the central Isqua plan. I think it just needs the connectivity there. Um, as far as the story, I think the story that was created here was really for city council. It's not for the users of this document. And so I think we can eliminate the need for change area. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get back to that. Where's your document? Word document, ah. okay. So <laughs> I think we can get rid of all of the need for change area. We can take the reset and that explains the what this document is, when it was last edited, why it was last edited. We could add in a sentence there. District Visions Community Conversations, again, that was something that's 
for city council, not for the user. And then the fresh look, I think we can modify that a little bit to say, here's how you use the visions in this document to say, this is what this next portion is all about. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Vicki Hunt. Um, I'm on PPC. I'm also a resident. I live at 925 Highwood Drive Southwest. And um, I first just wanted to say the first sentence, I think we really need to change it because it starts with a, a negative clause and um, it was brought up before, but I do think it's more than wordsmithing, but to not start with um, that we are known for primarily for strip malls, I think we need, we should start with more pride. Um, <laughs> And then I, um, as far as the green necklace goes, I like the improvements that were made. Um, I think that one distinction that could be made is a more realistic overlay of what's there already and then some, maybe the pearls to connect what could go there. So we have this, um, so we have like a translucent overlay showing so you could see through to what's there and then um, because often circles are used on maps for wayfinding for paths, so that could be where, where we would like to see connections. And um, also the other thing, I think that the document, um, the other sections follow really well with the developer actions and then the city actions and the measures of success, and um, I would like that to be on the green necklace section. One of the things that we talked about in the meeting was calling out the green necklace as its own section, and it is called out more, and I think it's emphasized more, but I would like to see those actions because then we could have more of a roadmap for those. Thank you all. Thank you. Next. Good evening again, uh, Ron Fall, uh, serve on PPC. So um, actually, listening to your comments is, um, it seems like you guys are just pulling thoughts out of my head the whole time, so um, I kind of appreciate that. I was like, wow, okay, great. Um, so here's my, some of my concerns, and um, Paul's comments about the, um, the corridors is really important. Our fish is kind of the canary in the coal mine, and the fact that we're actually was you have coal mines here is kind of an oxymoron. But <laughs> the really the reality is the fish are are carries in a coal mine. Um, as far as the green necklace, uh, I think green necklace and ST3 are both very substantial attributes to our city. I think they need to be. Um, they have their own section. The green necklace to me is too hypothetical. Um, and how do I, I say hypothetical? It's too abstract, and like what uh, Lindsay was saying, there's, we are already 75% of the way there. We've got a map. I think we should just further define it so that we can make sure that we have um, properties allocated as what Ken's point was. Um, so I think we're all in line with that. It, it just needs to be in this document. Um, and ST3 is too substantial to not have its own section. Um, and it's kind of the, our neighborhoods build around what is probably going to be the area of ST3. Um, so I think that's really important that we bake that into this model. Um, and as um, Keith mentions, if we pooch the highway to put ST3 underneath, how is that going to affect the potential neighborhoods? Um, and as far as the, um, the neighborhoods, I think it's okay that we call a friend, so to speak, to get some assistance on how to put this vision, uh, how to make a, a stronger visionary document. Um, it's not a bad thing to ask. Um, kind of a, a hypothetical that I'm looking at is you have the global city vision, and then you work down to neighborhood visions, and from the neighborhood vision, you have how the, the neighborhoods are connected with urban schools. I think urban schools needs its own section, its own vision and then just mentioned in this vision. Um, and then I, another one that I think is sort of missing is work, lay, work live, play. Um, if we're going to be the 
outdoors gateway, how, I mean, that's a really great marketing tool that we, I think we're missing. Um, to Paul's point, uh, this document is our brand statement and we should be able to use this document as a sales tool to recruit businesses into Issaquah. And I think that is absolutely dead on. And as far as holding out the moratorium, I believe that developers want to get it right. So they want to get maximum return on their property. If we get this document right and we tell them exactly what they need to do, I think they will be on board with it and I think they'll actually get a higher return on investment. But we need to make sure that this document is more mature than it is today before we open up the, uh, the moratorium. All right, thank you. Thank you. David? Just a little bit, David Kapler, a little bit about the wildlife corridors. We, um, we've identified Tibbetts Creek and Issaquah Creek. There's an effort in being looked at at uh, Laughing Jacobs Creek to reroute it into the park where it would be much better habitat and not form a delta right next to the boat launch, <laughs> which is kind of productive that way. Um, so there's that. There's We've had uh, two significant um, events on creeks, uh, Tibbetts area, the Snyder Creek, the uh, mitigation project there, which complicated some of the other development projects in that area, and um, the the whole uh, anti-aircraft creek um, work, which was a lot of money, a lot of disruption, but um, it should be, you know, it will become um, also a wildlife corridor beyond fish, because it's, especially because it gets right to the, the county's uh, parkland there and comes right out of open space, a nice, quite wide open space along Tibbetts Creek. Um, the green, green necklace. Um, we got, we got three efforts going on trying to define that in a way. We got the, king, the city's park plan, we have the, the update to the Central Issaquah plan, and the third effort came up late Monday night, and that's the um, EIS that the state park is doing. And um, a year ago, I became chair of the trails working group for Friends of Lake Sammamish State Park. But we didn't do much until this whole EIS issue. So we, yesterday we had two meetings, one in the field and one at the trail house, talking about the, this, what plans for trails or what trails do we think um, we want that connect within the park, but you know really connect to Sammamish, Issaquah, Cougar Mountain, all the rest. And um, it's, a, it's a big deal. And if we get those, figure out which trails we want, and we get those in the EIS, the chance for getting funding for those trails is, gets much, much better. So that's, that's a big ongoing effort, and it's a lot broader and needs to be, especially with city money in it, <laughs> that, than just the boundaries of the existing state park. We also have this new city property that adjoins on the east side of East Lake Sammamish Parkway which has some potential for some, some trail, some new, new trails we haven't even considered at all and haven't explored. Um, so we got that. Now in terms of the green necklace, let's, uh, there's been references to what a developer might want or need and I think they need more specific information because if they know that the trail is actually gonna happen, they will hopefully see this as an amenity and plan their development taking advantage of that. If they don't know what's really coming at them and it's gonna be seen as a, a liability. We wanna turn this thing into an asset that developers think is cool and is actually a benefit to their property and they design around it rather than seeing it as an imposition um, on them. So that's, that's the key. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Ken? Ken Eastman. Um, so the more I attend these meetings, uh, city meetings, the more I appreciate how little I know. Um, <laughs> and I do have an immense amount of respect and admiration for all the horsepower in this room from the council and staff and the commissioners and uh, 
and the public experts, <laughs> David and Connie and Ken, et cetera. Uh, so all of that to say I'm coming from a perspective of just Joe Average citizen that uh, doesn't know a whole heck of a lot. Um, but I do have some perspectives. Um, and so I'd get real tactical here. Um, Issaquah really is a special place and it's worth getting right. I think other cities around the Puget Sound have probably lost that ability. Uh, we still have it. This is really a great place. Um, I would suggest that what we see in central Issaquah right now isn't what we'll have 30 years from now. Um, I think in most cases that's pretty much a blank sheet of paper. All those low-rise industrial buildings will be gone and the retail probably will shift and change and probably only a few of the really new big buildings will be here 30 years from now. So this really is a blank sheet of paper uh, in my mind. And I also think that if you don't have a plan and you don't lay everything out, what you're going to get is just a haphazard um, collection of development that's based on what the market will bear and what rights the property owners have and what they choose to put in there that maximizes um, their property. Um, so all of that to say, um, I really wonder when I look at that blank sheet of paper, where does everything go? Um, where are the public spaces, the schools, the retail, the housing, the transit, the roads, the trails? Where does it all go? Because if you're laying out something with a 30-year plan, it just seems to me you ought to sit down to every little piece of property and say that's where we're going to put the school and that's where we're going to put the park and that's where the firehouse goes. Or it just happens. Now maybe that's through zoning, um, maybe that's through other methods, but as a resident, who doesn't know a whole heck of a lot, uh, and I'll be the first to admit that. It just seems to me like these are very lofty visions and goals, but um, I think more tactically, and I don't think you're done until you lay it out. Um, so I thank you for the consideration. Thank you. Anybody else, Mel? Mel Morgan from uh, the Central Issaquah Task Force, and I'll try to be brief. Just one quick thing. I, we use the phrase live, work, play a lot in our meetings, almost every meeting. And I'm going through the visions, and I, I can't seem to find live, work, and play in here. But what struck me about it was when we added in neighborhood schools, and I thought there's 7,100 residents supposed to be here. We will need schools. I think what it should be is we should incorporate live, work, play, and learn. And we should have those four words somewhere in the document. So, thank you. Steve. <laughs> okay, where are the schools going to be? Yeah, come on, Steve. <laughs> come on. I don't know. Get to the punchline. We're playing catch up. <laughs> The state planning policy for Vision 2040 didn't include anything to deal with the need for schools. I think that's a flaw, a pretty fatal flaw in the state planning process. I think that there's a good opportunity to start to talk about neighborhood schools and how they fit into the different neighborhoods where they should be and how that all can come together. And I think that's a good conversation that we should should work on, uh, live, work, play, and learn I think is, is a really positive Jesus. sort of uh, statement and uh, we'd be happy to talk with the city further about schools in the future. Just for folks who don't know, you're Steve, Steve Crawford with Isqual School District. Oh, I didn't say that. No. <laughs> Ani? So to back up a smidge, the neighborhood visions were being redone because it wasn't working. Um, and we're trying to create a community where the existing community are, is actually excited to have new things happen. So that means they need to see and understand some sort of public benefit. 
and you need to eliminate as much as possible the mighty smacking impacts that have been put on this town from the development that did happen. And so I was actually happy to see some of this language that considered the existing community equally important to the future community because without the existing community support, you're gonna have a heck of a hard time getting buy-in with the whole thing. Um, as for your comments on the structure, I got confused and I don't know if you could clarify. Uh, it sounded like you were trying to get rid of the initial statements that described the livability, et cetera, but you wanted to have some sort of cohesive, overarching set of ideals, and then you would go to each neighborhood and pull out only the distinctive parts. I didn't understand where you were going to define what was common amongst all the neighborhoods in Central Issaquah Plan, so that was clear, so then you could just use the neighborhoods for the details of each area. And I, you have to have that, otherwise you got a big, huge hole. Thanks. Do you? Hi, Steve Pereira, Old Town, about 10 years. Uh, I sent in some written comments as well, so I'll try not to repeat. Uh, agree with the idea on vision needs some more clarification, come back to environment. Um, housing, I'd still like to see a requirement for affordable housing, not an optional uh, thing that gets added in later. Um, economic vitality. I think we do good at measuring this in Issaquah. I don't think we're doing as well in all these other factors like our small town feel, our tree canopy, those type of things we need to find and put requirements to make that happen. Um, innovation, I didn't like this as much because it's a goal, it's not an outcome. We're, we're not measuring how much we innovate, we're, we're talking about what we get out of that innovation. I don't want as much to incentivize the things we want, I want to require the things that we want. Uh, uh, the comments on the livable, distinctive, connected, sustainable, I like tying those back to the individual neighborhoods so we don't lose the things that people particularly like, uh, but I wanna make sure that we have some definitions of what those things are throughout. Uh, and uh, the environment and the green necklace, so I like the green necklace in the sense that it was kind of a visualization of what we're gonna look like in 20 or 30 years. We have a tree canopy code that talks about it maintaining a 50% tree canopy. With all this development, we're gonna have a lot less tree canopy. Uh, based on this map, it's just gonna be built out, except for those green necklaces, that concerns me, because we're not, met, we're not known as being a place of strip malls or tall buildings, we're known for our beautiful environment. So I wanna make sure we don't lose that. Uh, we were talking about in the PPC meeting uh, that the protection of wildlife corridors, healthy streams, and that those type of things would get some more definition added to it. I know you can't put up a sign, this is a wildlife cross here, uh, but not over here, but we're gonna lose that connectivity for wildlife if we don't retain or require tree canopies in other areas. Tree environment talks about more than just, I guess, you, a green necklace could just be grass. It's not necessarily forests, it's not necessarily places for wildlife. I, we need to build that into the environment. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, seeing none. We're gonna move on to the actual neighborhood visions. Okay, so Western Gateway, um, there was some conversation about potentially taking Western Gateway out. Um, 
one of the task force members objected to that vehemently. Um, what we talked about was uh, wildlife corridors um, and measures of success. Uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about Newport and missing pedestrian and bike facilities on Newport. Um, and also making Newport feel more like it's for local residents and not for regional traffic. But there was also um, some conversation about making safe and convenient crossings of Newport, um, especially since we have um, a King County trailhead um, on the, is that the south side? On the south side um, that residents on the north side are gonna wanna get to. Um, so we also talked about, uh, you know, this is called the Western Gateway. Um, at the moment, it's missing a gateway um, feature. And where would that gateway feature want to be? And I think there was some initial um, thought that the future pedestrian and bike crossing um, from Western Gateway over to the state park could have um, some sort of feature incorporated into it, which would be that gateway element that we were looking for. But there was also a suggestion that we include language that talks about putting it in the I-90 right away. So potentially as uh, they talk about noise attenuation, which might be walls, might be something else, um, you know, there could be some art or other design elements that could be incorporated into those facilities that would help regional, pe re regional travelers know that, you know, this was a distinct place that was worthy of attention. So uh, those were kind of the main kind of topical uh, changes to... Keith, could you pull up the document too? I can sure do that. You want the today future section or get to the boxes? I have a question about the future. Okay. Uh, what is the future I-90 improvements that will reflect the distinctive character? So it says, after Lake Samantha State Park, right in the middle, it says noise attenuation will be incorporated into, incorporate into future I-90 improvements. Do, are there specific improvements or are we just talking about what so, um, so Ron left, so I can be specific. <laughs> so just kidding. So, um, so we talked about noise walls, uh, and it That's was a very right. specific conversation about noise walls, and WashDOT has incorporated um, design elements into noise walls throughout 405 and I-5, and you sure, know, what was being talked about. So my, but my question, oh, I'm sorry. that's okay, I listened to all those conversations. My question is, I, I understood the noise attenuation, the noise conversations, but with it says, will be incorporated into future I-90 improvements. There's not any specific future I-90 improvement we're thinking about, we're just thinking about any. It's just, that, it's just that we envision that in order to protect this neighborhood from noise, that we would be actively involved in noise attenuation. No? Am I getting so, it wrong? Um, so I think what this is trying to say is, and maybe it's not doing a very good job, so a gateway feature element will be incorporated into I-90 right away in the new connection over I-90. Noise attenuation will be incorporated into future improvements that will reflect the distinctive character of our community. I think what that was trying to say specifically was if it's noise walls, if it's a combination of walls and landscaping that you know, there's a sense that like on 405, as you go, as you run through Kirkland and Redmond, um, all of that just kind of feels very nondescript. Um, and I think what was intended here was that we would work with WashDOT to, whether it's incorporating art or specific, um, in, you know, design elements into those facilities that it would, um, it would distinguish us maybe from other communities that are along the freeway. Okay, so it's not about a specific project, it's about if there is a project, this is what we would try to achieve. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Question also about the future. So I, I actually did have a really hard time with this one. I get um, Mary Lynch's comments 
about why it should stay in and also a concern that the neighborhood just didn't get, the existing neighborhood just didn't get much yet. Uh, they, they will when the Mountain Sound Greenway Trail is done. I think they'll get a better road when Newport Way is funded and built. But other than that, it's been more of a burden than a benefit, absolutely. And it, this is the one that was the most different originally. I'm on the fence as to whether it should stay in or stay out. A um, couple of reasons. If the parks plan showed improvements within a five-year time frame in this neighborhood on these pieces of land, I'd say we can get them everything they need without having them in. Why have them in? The answer might be there's a couple of little parcels remaining and, and they ought to, but the part that I really did not like was um, it will be a mixed density residential neighborhood that provides a sense of arrival. It doesn't provide any sense of arrival unless, you know, maybe sound wall decorations and an overpass does. To me, that's kind of just signage, but it really isn't. Uh, a gate, a gateway, but it's also not a tra it's not a transition from traditional suburban residential to neighborhoods. All along Newport Way, further down, we have some of our more vertical structures and our apartments. It's actually just density along I-90. The suburban part is to the south uphill. Nobody sees that. So if somebody read this and said, well, I'm going to drive in and see where this is, they wouldn't see a transition. So I think, there um, so the, the, tr the transitional buildings aren't built yet. Um, so the ones that are right next to the freeway that are going to be four stories on a concrete deck, mm -hmm. uh, the concrete deck's there and they're starting to frame up. Um, I think you're going to get a sense that once those are built and when Gateway Senior's built, so Gateway Senior you're going to see from the freeway as well. So you're going to come basically from Eastgate. You're going to be coming eastward. You're going to go through kind of the forested area. You're going to hit Gateway, and you're going to see, I think, um, a four-story Gateway Senior project. You're going to see those two buildings that are right next to the freeway that are basically five stories. Then you're going to see the Rally Hotels, and I think you're going to, it's going to, I think, pull you into that more dense vision of Central Issaquah. You don't have to agree with that. I think well, no, that's the I way it's going to I agree with that, actually. Yeah. I agree with the way you just said it. What I don't agree with is that it says it's a um, arrival as the housing starts to transition from traditional suburban. No, it doesn't. It's This is your first dense look at Issaquah. This is, this is, this is the, the high density leading into the core. So it's not really a transition of, at all. It's. Uh, unless you were meaning to say it's transitioning from traditional, like, this is what it was and now it's dense. I just, the first sentence just didn't make sense to me. Okay. I, it really is, this is gonna be your first peek at the density. You're gonna come down that hill and you're gonna see the four story, two four story complexes leading into a tall hotel and then you know you've hit town yeah. because you see those. So. Um, okay, I can rework that. I don't disagree with that. And I guess the other thing is I would love to hear what the other council members too think about um, <coughs> keeping it in or keeping it out at some point because really what's missing is the parks amenities that haven't really mm -hmm. materialized. You want to go again? Yeah. That's actually part of last week's recording I didn't get to as far as the deliberation about this in or out. I do find it interesting. Uh, I, I agree, plus one on that first sentence, provides a sense of arrival. Now, not, not too many gateways have only one side. Like, if I think of a gate, if, and you, you just use the uh, experience of traveling eastbound on I-90, and you described what the eye might see if you're looking to your right, it doesn't feel like a gateway to me because I'm traveling down a strip of asphalt and that happens to be on my right. Now, if there's a connectivity, I mean, you get to the physical aspect of this when you talk about a non-motorized connectivity over the road, you know, to, this, uh, to the north side. Now, bo both sides were incorporated into it. That would feel like a gateway. This just doesn't feel like a gateway. There's not much of a... I, I, and, <coughs> The sense of arrival, even when you're coming down uh, Newport Way, um, you know, maybe there, maybe there's a, you know, a sign on the side of the road or something. Uh, but they, I'm, I'm, I didn't give that a lot of thought. I'm just this, this. It, I do struggle with calling this a gateway. It's, it's physical proximity. Uh, it's the built environment that's there now. Um, it's adjacent, just across the road, there's an extensive, we can see in the map, an existing built environment that's not technically part of it, but in spirit, they feel part of it, I believe. So I'm not sure that this is really that well defined. 
uh, in term, uh, or accurately defined as a gateway. I felt that, I feel that way strongly after, um, you know, you know uh, actually when you put it down that way, that, that provides a sense of arrival. So uh, I think when we look at what benefit, um, you know, that they could still uh, achieve, um, on the other side of the, of the ledger, I think what's really important to get the livability, whether or not we say it there or not, is, is the base, your basic needs, the amenities to satisfy family or household's basic needs being close at hand. Um, uh, it's not gonna be trivial to get to the grocery store on foot and back uh, unless something else happens in this area. And I th I'm gonna take food as like number one. The proximity of a grocery store to where people are living uh, is gonna be very key to reduce just internal trips and also improve uh, a livability. And of course, there's other opportunities. We can talk about education and recreation uh, as well. So I think for that reason, uh, developing as a more complete sub-district or neighborhood, um, I think those are reasons to keep it in because I want to encourage, uh, we do want to see, again, I'm going to get back to that economic, it's not only livability, but the economic element as well. So some type of amenities that are there to actually satisfy the basic needs would, I mean, there's nothing there uh, in this. There's not enough, so your economic development director is going to tell you there's not enough rooftops to support retail. They'll, it won't happen. I mean, if you think about Talus, Talus, <laughs> Talus is over a thousand rooftops, and they're going to yeah. get a wine and coffee bar max, right? Completely agree. As a matter of fact, yeah. I was going to just uh, right over there. There was a neighborhood shop that's yeah. now gone, right? Yeah. And there's nobody, no, but no uh, business person has decided that it's worth their risk to bring it back uh, because there apparently isn't the lo local economy to to support that. So, I, so I get that, but that's. Um, but not everything has to be, um, you know, uh, you know, even that size of a store to meet basic some of the basic needs. So I'm so all of that is I feel a little bit conflicted. I see the gateway part doesn't resonate for me and never really has. But uh, for to 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 achieve some of the vision and especially in terms of livability, perhaps um, uh, keeping it in is our best way of uh, uh, achieving those. Mm -hmm. Any comment on that? I, sure. I, I just um, I just felt um, very uninspired by where we were going to be in this in Western Gate right in the future. And if I was living in that area with all the development that's going on, um, I would not. I think I wouldn't be happy looking at this document. So I, I highlighted, I went through the first few and I didn't finish, but I highlighted sort of the attributes of how we tried to describe what's there and what we described that's gonna be in the future. And for this one, the main difference between today and the future is that new connection over, like, um, mm -hmm. over I-90. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you go over to the city implementing actions, it says, okay, you're gonna get a public park, we're gonna work on noise from I-90, art on I-90, um, some pet pedestrian bike facilities on Newport, um, which is not insignificant, um, and transit, some transit, um, and then develop a board rock replacement strategy plan, and then uh, work on implementa implementation of the Tibbetts Greenway plan. But I, I'm not sure that I see that we've done everything we can to um, enhance put in a plan how we're going to enhance this area if we if we want it in the central Esquire area and I think we owe it to them to that area mm -hmm. I think we we need to work hard to figure out what we're going to do um, for lack of a better word I'll use the word mitigate to mitigate what's going on over there in that neighborhood um, and I was uninspired by what we're envisioning for the future there I think we could do much better so, um, so, so this neighborhood um, has, um, I mean, so, so, you know, when I look at this neighborhood, I'll go back to the map, you know, so right now, Gateway and, and Gateway Senior are taking this piece of property and all of this property. You've got the existing Sammamish Point townhouses, which I don't think any of us see going away. You've got Tibbetts Creek, um, which runs kind of along this edge down here. 
And then Riva is kind of right in this little area right here. So, so the, I guess, although I, I don't disagree this is not that inspiring, I think it is what it is, and I think it is gonna be what it is for the next 50 years. And so the question is, is what do you think um, makes this neighborhood better? Well, its own city park, I think, would be great, and I think we're on the, the track for doing that. I think, you know, if I lived in here and there was a future direct connection to the state park, it's awesome, that would be awesome. Um, that was one of the reasons reasons why a large recreational headquarters was not interested in a piece of Issaquah was because of uncertainty about that. But that would have changed the conversation quite a bit if that if we knew that was coming. Um, you do have a couple properties. Um, one's a vet property, and then there's another one owned by uh, Derek Doak that are still yet to be done. Um, maybe, and maybe what's missing is the recognition of the um, very significant change that has come to this community in such a short period of time. Recognition in this document that, I don't know exactly what that looks like, but um, that's not captured in here, the significant development that's happened in, in that area that's continuing to happen. Um, and I don't have it all gelled or perfect in my mind. I don't know whether we should leave it in or take it out. I kind of think we need, we need to leave it in so that we can continue to work on making that, just like every other sub area, the best place it can be. Um, and I do want to say too that um, a couple of meetings ago, we had a public, uh, someone here from the public commented that, look, we're not going to be able to dictate and foresee what's gonna happen in 30 or 40 years. What we're trying to do with, a, with, with the plans that we have now is set us up, set us up for, the, for the next phase. Um, and you know, Carrie McGill said that to me and I thought it was profound because we keep looking ahead 30, 40 years. We can't do that. We don't know what's gonna happen with retail. We don't know what's gonna happen with um, just economic drivers like that. But we wanna set, us up, set ourselves up for the future. Um, and just take the next steps. And so by taking it out, I fear that we won't pay attention to that neighborhood any longer. And I think they deserve um, some attention. So that's, I don't know particularly exactly what that looks like, like I said, and I do think that a, you know, a connection would be great. Um, but I, I think we need some work here to acknowledge what they're going through. Um, <coughs> so, I think the part that I really wrangle with in this is that we took one whole district and built it into re residential, and that's not what it was supposed to be in the neighborhood. We actually built this one, I'll go so far as to say, in an existing neighborhood that was pretty happy. <laughs> so there was all kinds of residential up there. This residential butted up to it. There was gonna be certain outcomes, didn't happen. So now it is what it is. It is all residential. It's probably residential for a lengthy period of time. So it's not a gateway. It's not a gateway when you're on Newport. It's not a gateway when you're on I-90. I'd, I'd argue that there is enough existing residential there now that if we're gonna rebrand this corner and they wanna be called West Newport or whatever they wanna be called, I'll go with what the community already there says they are. You know, they are a series of different builders. Each little subdivision has its name, but maybe they want to decide, hey, yep, these are our new neighbors, and we are what we are. And for that reason, I think that would be a good example of the Central Isquah plan trying to connect to a community that already exists instead of creating something sort of in isolation from the community that already exists. So the gateway name does not work for me at all. Um, the I agree both with Paul and Stacy that taking it out at this point in time could could cause more harm than good. Um, but I'm not exactly clear what they're getting. Saying that someday you might get a crossing over I-90, well, someday you may get not get a crossing over I-90, or you might, won't get a park. Then what? We just abandon them if they don't get those two things. I don't. I don't feel like we're keeping up on our part of the bargain to have all of the elements there to make it a sustainable, enjoyable, livable place. It's obviously not going to be work. It's obviously not going to be retail. But I don't think we've given them much else. So it needs to be clear what they're getting, and we need to call it what it is. It's a dense residential neighborhood in the new blank area of town, whatever that area of town wants to call themselves. There's a ton of houses there already, a ton of people. They know what they are. 
So they can come up with a better name than Gateway. Gateway doesn't work at all. So, um, you know, I, I, I think my comment would be for you, whether you like it or not, <laughs> is, um, is that, you know, what this does is, you know, by, and I, I think we've unpacked kind of what the city's implementing actions are. I think the purpose for that is so that we can then seed our capital improvement plan to actually start to work on some of those things. Because now we know what, what we're obligating ourselves to do. We're much clearer in what the developers are obligated to do, but we're also clearer on what we expect to do. And we've also then identified what the success, what we call success for this neighborhood. So maybe we need to spend some time talking about these things because maybe these are not attainable, maybe they are attainable. I mean those are those are what we would say, hey this is this is this would be great. If we can get these things, you know, in the next thirty years um, that would be great. And then maybe we, we move the bar and say, okay, the next 30 years after that, what would we want? And maybe at that point we would want mixed use. I don't know. I'm not saying, I'm not gonna be here, so that'll be fine <laughs> if you wanna say that. So, um, so the way this works, now we're down to the mechanics and, and I wanted to kind of spend a little bit of time. This was to Mary Lou's uh, uh, question earlier, I think. So, um, you know, so how we would use this, connect, so I'm gonna take a specific thing. So connect residents with nature through trails and accessible open space. So let's take one of those parcels that haven't built yet, right? So now there's this, and what this is very specific, it says you need to now provide connections for your residents to trails um, and to open space that you give them access to. So, so when somebody would come in with a plan, if they did not have that, we could make them do that. So even though this isn't code, because it doesn't say, you know, you're gonna provide exactly this, because to do that in a, at a plan level is really hard, because there's too many variables. But we can say, hey, you know what, what's important to us, what's important, what's distinctive about this neighborhood, um, is that the, the residents in this neighborhood are gonna have access to trails and open space. That's super important. If you agree, if you don't agree, then we'll take it out. I but agree. but it's super important. And so now we have a tool that we can use to actually get it. And that was one of the biggest things that I heard y'all say about the previous visions. They were written so broadly that it didn't give the staff the tools to actually get what it is we thought we were getting. So this is now very specific. Um, and there'll be a code section later that we're gonna talk about, because there's gonna need, I talked to Jim about, okay, if we write this really specific, can we make them do this? And um, I got a maybe. Um, <laughs> so um, there is a code piece that helps us get it, not maybe, but Assuredly, and so we'll want to do at least one code piece with these visions, assuming we get to that endpoint. We'll talk about that uh, later. So that's that's so these things are what we PPC task force and staff and the public kind of put together for Western Gateway. I'm going to stop talking. How many slides is your code piece? One. You want to see it? Yeah, let's, right. just, let's just do it. Let's get there. All right, so. Oh, I'm in the Word doc, sorry. I don't multitask very well. Okay, so within um, Central Issaquah Development and Design Standards, uh, 1819 A1, which is purpose and applicability, and this is where I would stick it. Um, so 11C, the purpose of this section is to allow the continued operation of existing uses and existing developments that were legally established when Central Issaquah Plan became effective, and to allow expansion of existing uses and developments that are consistent with the development and design standards. In all cases, development shall strive to comply with the goals and policies in the Central Issaquah Plan, and then here's the new language, and shall comply with the developer obligations identified in the sub-district visions. So with this language, we can then, because this will be code, we can then say that the districts are mandatory. The district visions and the developer obligations are mandatory. So for Western Gateway. Yes. There's, 
there's um, there's three. So connect. Sorry, I'm reading them. Connect residents with nature through trails and accessible open space. Celebrate Mountains to Sound Trail and Cougar Mountain Trailhead with pedestrian and bicycle connections and wayfinding signage. Take advantage of grade changes to provide vistas of Lake Sammamish. That's the distinctive. Yeah, everything. you're right. You're right. Sorry. I yellowed it. Provide part. You're right. Never mind. I had yellowed something. <laughs> I just looked at that one thing. I want to say thank you for showing us the code. Yeah. I mean, as a tool, that was a, it's an essential link. And I, and I think the challenge before us is to um, recognize what's already, recognizing what's already there, perhaps working with that, it's being able to say clearly what our vision and therefore what outcomes and what goals and outcomes we seek. And how close do you actually go to codifying that? Well. I've been wondering about that uh, and how you make this link. So this link, that changes the lens with which I would be looking at this <laughs> lingo. And I don't think we're going to have the word celebrate as a developer obligation. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, that's the level of detail I think we're going to have to talk about if you're going to, if that code, if that code update is really it. That's a question about that code up. Why in the unchanged part does it just say strive? I, I knew you were going to go there. That word, <laughs> strive. So, you can always say I tried and failed. This um, is what you get. I hate that word. So I, I I'd say shall comply. Um, okay. So obviously I was not wanting. I was wanting to show you what we were going to add to get the vision piece in. Um, if we're going to go back and 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 work on existing code language, you guys can give us the direction that you want us to do that. Um, I think uh, we want certainty. I know you don't like strive to comply. Yeah, not at all. I don't like development shall strive. The development, development shall do. doesn't strive. No. So. So then this, if that's, um, I think it can be enforceable, but the, those developer obligations then become critical. Critical. Absolutely. Um, that was my intent all along. However. Yes. This is just new language that, um, a new strategy, enforcement strategy, so to speak, that has come about since November 30th, true? This is relating to um, a comment that we needed to provide a better linkage between the vision and the outcome. But recent, and so I'm, the reason I'm asking is because I'm not sure, just like Paul mentioned, that all of the developer obligations have been looked at through the these can be enforceable lens which makes this language really important. Okay. I would hope that, I don't want to speak for the 12 people in the room that were part of that process, I would hope that we were all reviewing that language with an expectation that we could get that. Um, now, I don't, I don't, um, well, I don't, I don't disagree with the word celebrate. I'm not sure how that got there. It slipped through the cracks. But um, I agree. The, the words need to mean something, and I think celebrate is a little bit um, loose. Well, um, I, the, the reason I don't think that that's the lens that, and I, I, don't, I don't know, but that that's the lens that was looked through, that these would be actually enforceable. Because more than one time, the, the question was raised about needing the code that would, that would get us the vision. So well, that's the link. But I think this is what we wanted. But I don't know that that's, or this was thought about it. This is what we wanted. But not sure that those were actually the things that were going to be enforced. So that's my perception after watching. A couple comments. You know, I don't know how, a in addition to celebrate, I mean, the phrase like, take advantage of. What do you do with that? Take advantage of grade changes to provide vistas to Lake Sammamish. Take advantage of. 
So if you have uh, property, let me finish. The, I wasn't. Let me in general. I I, I think. Um, I know you you have an answer. I can tell. But I, I, but I think there's the other partner in the room that we, I would want to hear from as well, and that be I would be I would want to hear from development community as well about this. Um, I, I think that that would be when I mean, we're, we're we're saying okay, we're going to obligate. This is something you can work with, in general. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't have experience tying a vision to code, uh, and and now all of a sudden. Um, I just this is this is you've changed the game significantly in my mind. So okay, well, so I assume the game was we want more predictability on the outcome, mm -hmm. and this is how you get there. All right, no more wishy-washy coulds, woulds, maybes. Strive to comply. I, we can I can write that all day, and you're not going to get it, and and so and that's going to take us nowhere off the platform we're on now, which is, you know, the train's not coming to the station because we're on a moratorium. So if you guys want predictability, then we need to have language that we can count on. And, you know, there's going to be some interpretation on some of this language because this isn't exactly code in the point. It doesn't, it's not the same as you can build a 40, store, a 40 foot high building or a 120 foot tall building. You know, it's not exact. This is more like performance standards where you say, you know what, I want, I want to make sure that your community has a connection to the open space and the trail system. You could probably do that. 20 different ways, Mr. Developer, but you got to do it. So show me how you're going to do that, all right? The language on that slide was you have to comply. Um, so compliance can take a number of different steps. So why did you say maybe when you said you talked to Jim and you said, is there a way for us to get there? And does this get us there? And you said, maybe. <laughs> so his initial take on it was if we didn't do the code piece at the end, you know, we can, so, we can try. We can try. Um, and, you know, and, and SEPA is a place where you can do some of that because policies, these things can tend to look more like policies, and policies and SEPA work together. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes down to site plans and land use permits, um, this wants to be something a little bit hard, harder than that. So I actually, I like the structure, but when I read it, I didn't, real, I didn't read the developer obligations through that lens. Again, that's why they felt a little light in the air. So for example, you said there's two more properties along Newport Way. Provide mo mobility improvements that f facilitate connections to Lake Sam State Park. How are they going to do that? What would satisfy that for those last two parcels? Sure. So right now there is a landing that is part of the Gateway Project. Um, and that landing is for the southern landing of that I-90 bridge to Lake Sammamish State Park. So the question would be for the vet property or the other property further to the west, how are you going to facilitate your residents getting to that location with the assumption that some point in time be a connection. there'll be a bridge over, right? Good question, good answer. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, was, answer. I had the same question. So this is enlightening. And the regional growth center. Right. So I get the sense from that answer that for every one of these, there, you have a specific amenity that may just be in concept right now, but the target connection. Um, so, I mean, when you say the, okay, which I now know is Issaquah Valley instead of RGC, right? Right. So what's the specific one there? So right now we have a, um, we have a boardwalk that goes from Gateway to over Tibbetts Creek and lands in Hyla Crossing. These have to be in our TIP? No, the, the Gateway Development built it. That's why there's No, a, I'm just saying, I actually, oh. more generally now, when you start talking about enhancements to infrastructure, park, mobility, that are capacity related, that developers must provide, do they have to be on our TIP? Not if we have them here. If they're part of the vision, 
No. Okay, just not on the TIP just means, right, we're not gonna go get some other funding. They're not gonna qualify for any other type of grants. We're gonna have to figure it out ourselves. Right. So for that one, just to finish off, there's a missing piece of boardwalk on Riva. So if, if one of those last two developers said, okay, well, my, my people are gonna walk down the sidewalk of Newport, you know, uh, to SR 900 and then down 900, you know, to Gilman, I'm gonna be like, no, there's a, there's a more direct pathway on the boardwalk, but there's a missing piece, so maybe you've gotta provide that missing piece at Riva. So I think, I mean, I, but that's negotiated. Some of that, you know, I think we'll be able to negotiate uh, with the developers because there might be more than one way to get there. So Keith, back to Ken's comment earlier, it kind of terrifies me that the answers are in your head. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, <laughs> what I would like to see me too. is a GAPS map, because mm -hmm. a GAPS map would have showed us that landing. Yeah. And then we would know, oh, that's what Keith's talking about, there's a landing. A GAPS map would have showed us what boardwalks exist. And so we would read that and say, oh, I see the little piece of boardwalk. But there's no... Besides somebody coming in and talking to you, they, you don't know. Yeah. You don't know what those pieces are. And rather than write them in here because they could change every year as a gap is filled, that green necklace and those transportation linkages, they have to show with the vision. They have to, they, it doesn't make any sense right now. It's like all in your head. You have to, that, it, that's just, just an odd place. But it's going to head. Well, I mean, we're in an odd place. Well, <laughs> so and I don't, I don't necessarily disagree. There's not a lot of transparency to that. But the problem is, is it's fluid, right? So as projects come along and build certain facilities, that landscape changes, right? The opportunities maybe to make connections could, and I'm, let's get out of Western Gateway and go to like, um, you know, go to like the Commons, and as no, they stay, stay in Western Gateway because I think that. The issue is that we're headed in the right direction here, but we still don't have certainty and clarity. Certainty for the community that lives here and clarity for the builders that come in and want to do something. So I get it that it changes every year, but we update our comp plan every year and we can update the gaps. Right. What I, as a builder or a resident here, I would not know what you have meant by 3.1. I would not know what I'm complying with. And so... Um, I'm glad you had an answer. I agree with Paul. It's great. You had an answer. It's not clear at all. This is not clear. And and each district is different yep. and has a different gap or actually a complete blank slate. Who knows? But that, that needs to come through. I mean, it doesn't need to say, here, you need to build off this platform. But this doesn't work without the gaps map. It just doesn't work. Yeah, the I-90 overcrossing is not even on page 45. Okay, so we've we've hammered some things. Um, it's nine o'clock, and we are on Western Gateway. We have another agenda, um, another item on our agenda that's related to the moratorium. So um, we need to move on, unless there's something super important that you want to talk about with Western Gateway. Um, Not with Western Gateway. I'm good. And um, because we well, have to get, we also have to get to the point where um, we need to decide what yep. what we're going to do with this agenda bill tonight, and we also have to provide. Where are you going? You well, not yet, but. Um, <laughs> Just going to go home. Uh, <laughs> with all the stuff so, in my head. <laughs> and um, pr provide opportunities for public comment. And um, so I just wanted to move us further ahead. Yep. Um, I think we can provide feed. I mean, if we're at the point where we're wordsmithing, then you need to tell me because we're going to be here super late. <laughs> no. Yes. Okay. So um, I don't think we are, but we haven't talked about it. Um, so what's your pleasure? Do you want to... Do you want to move through the next yes. ones yeah. um, and then get public comment at the end? Do you want to get, um, you can do public comment on each one of the sub-districts? And then I would be um, strongly, in, I mean, <laughs> encouraging people to be judicious about which ones you comment on and what you say, because we'd be here very late. So I'm asking the committee members what their preference is. It's hard when the districts are so different to mm -hmm. tell the public to wait till the end of every single discussion. Yeah.
I see there being, after tonight, at least, at least one more period of staff on. updates. To land a chore. And coming back. I agree. I'll say at the same time, I, 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 this is, I couldn't envision this after the last time we talked and met about it here at Landed Shore, but it's, it's moved significantly in the right direction. Mm -hmm. It's gone pretty far. And I feel I can see what the end might look like, which I couldn't before. So that's good, really good. I, um, I agree with those statements. I'm still concerned about the code part. Mm -hmm. um, I need, because I need to look at it through that lens. And so I'm, I'm not gonna be able to do that fully tonight, but if we have more time, I'll be able to do that. Yeah. So if we want to take public comment after this section, each neighborhood or however neighborhoods we end up doing, okay. I'm good with that as All well. Right. I do want to make a couple um, comments because I want some feedback perhaps during public set, uh, comment on this on well. And it's in the measures of success area on this place called the Western Subdistrict, currently known as the Western Gateway. <laughs> <laughs> And I was kind of struck by the language that had everything to do with Newport Way. And um, again, I didn't see the entire uh, recording of the meeting that covered, covered this part. But um, in every one of those areas, when it comes to livability, I mean, the, that um, I, can, I can pick it apart. The street prioritizes Issaquah residents over regional commuters. And I'm thinking, okay, like I'm a resident. I use that road all the time. What does that look and feel like? I don't know. Uh, but I don't come and go from my living abode off Newport Way, but I use that corridor all the time. So I'm, I, I'm like, how do you, what's that measure? If it's this, so I don't know how you measure that or exactly what it's getting at. And I saw that in a couple of these and over in the, um, in the distinct column as well. Newport Corridor functions as the entrance to the Issaquah Alps. Okay, I wanna hit Tiger Mountain, but some reason I gotta come around. I mean, and that's kind of a silly example, but no. So I'm not really sure what we're trying to get out there and how you measure that. It, it serves that purpose. You, I mean, if you want to get to Cougar, if you want to get to Cougar or Squawk, you know, yeah, you might use that corridor. I wasn't quite sure what was um, what was measurable from that. Um, I, and the next one as well, uh, what be, uh, becomes a model for successfully changing a high-speed regional roadway to a asset for the neighborhood. Um, not sure how you measure that. Again, I didn't hear, I haven't heard that there's more in the conversation that people can enlighten me. I'd, I'd like to hear about that. But when it comes to measurability, um, uh, I, I'm struggling with that one. In the um, connected area, you see resident, find convenient mobility to other parts. I'll leave that one alone. And, uh, and then I just thought the, the first and third bullet in the sustainable column sounded the same to me when we think about wildlife quarters actually being the riparian habitat along streams. Okay. Sorry. Comments? Public? Ken and Lindsay. I'll make it quick. Um, I'll speak for myself. I know when, when we went through this, again, I, as I said, it was rushed, and I certainly didn't look at the developer obligations as something that would be enforced. Um, and if I did look at it that way, I'd want to spend a lot more time on it and a lot more detail. And I suggest we would need to do that before we either take that approach to making it code or finalizing the visions and really need to look at that in depth. And 
if I would look at it through that lens, I'd need at least uh, a few hours to write down my thoughts about what I think the developer obligation should be, the measures of success as well, um, all of those things. So um, I didn't see it that way, and I'm, I'm glad you're asking the questions, because if that's the approach we're taking, it needs a lot more effort. Thank you. Thank you. Lindsay? And then Joan. Yeah, so the three of you could continue to go through each of these neighborhoods, and I think that would be fine, but you've got a great team here who would love to dig into this based on your comments. I suggest instead of going through the next three neighborhoods that you guys email your comments to PPC, put it on the public record there, and give us one or two more shots at it rather than spending your time on it tonight. Thank you. Joan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Joan Probla, and um, I listened to all of you tonight, and I really believe that a lot more has to be done on this. This is our city that we're talking about, our future. And I don't think we're to a point where we can imagine this great place that we really want to live. I would, I don't like the way this is set up, but that's only me. I want to see, this is a vision. It needs to have pictures. It ha needs to ha show what it's going to be so that the community can bu actually buy into it. They can't buy into this. You know, it's just words, it's not a vision. Uh, we spent our first meeting trying to change the vision and um, didn't have the time, and absolutely, we have to start with that and work down the line. I know the staff has put an enormous amount of, of work into this, and we have done several hours, but I think we need to go a little bit further. I'm afraid that if, if you did approve something like this and then um, by the end of the year, January 1st, uh, a developer is going to come in and I don't think there's enough um, restrictions on him, them, to build what we actually want. We should be able to see what we want for our city. This is not getting us what we want. And it, it's up to you guys. It's your city. Where do you want your buildings? How do you want the parks? Where do you want them? Eventually, they might not eventually get there. It, you might change, but right now, what's the plan? There is no plan. So that's kind of what I'd like to see. And I agree that, uh, I mean, I, it, you can see that you have a really great planning policy commission. They really tear into things. They really go down to the nitty gritty. And if they're willing to spend another four or five hours in one meeting uh, going over this and taking your suggestions, I would really appreciate that. Thanks, Joan. Gip? I'm Skip Rowley, and I came tonight primarily to try to see that wordsmithing wasn't done and that the work that Keith has done gets approved and all of that, but it's really obvious from your comments that you're not there. Uh, I have a tendency to think in this term because the development agreement that we spent four years in obtaining thinks in this term except that there are specifics that we have to do that we are capable of doing because we have two very large chunks of property. We're not inhibited by property lines. Uh, we've got control over water lines. We can put our roads where they need to go. We got all sorts of different things that we have to do, but we have the ability to do it. And I don't mean that from being a cocky standpoint, I mean we have the land that makes the thing work. Uh, when your project, when you first got started on this, this was going to be a update of nine, no, it was 1,100 acres. And there were a lot of things written in the, the 
uh, CIP that, that were taken from our development agreement. The problem with it is, is that a lot of this stuff works for a large property owner, but it doesn't work for the small property owner. And so while you've been having these discussions about all the things that we want to do, we want to fix the corridors, we want to put in the trails, what's that do to the family that owns two acres of ground right over here, and how are they going to relate to this? And, and I mention it because nobody else has, and you've got a lot of people that have two acres of ground that they're going to want to do something. So as much as I would like to see this thing get done, I think there needs to be a lot more consideration. And hopefully you'll take a look at it from the individual standpoint and, and not make it so that it's confusing, but also I know that the average planner would start thinking about mitigations and you take the person that has owned the two acres of ground and what's he gonna do with it to make him be part of this, he's only gonna be able to do it by writing a check, and that isn't fair. So I'll let you figure that out, but I can see that there's a lot more work to be done. Thanks. Thank you, Skip. Ron? Ron Fall, PPC. So I'll actually make this really quick. Uh, Skip, I couldn't agree more with you in terms of the smaller property owner. If looking at it from that standpoint, if I was a small property owner and I wanted to be, a, uh, and I was going to develop, having a clear vision would help me understand whether or not I'd want to sell my property or how I might want to develop it if I want to put in condos or apartments or um, a house or uh, maybe a senior center or accessory dwelling unit. That's actually really important and based on where this vision's, the changes of this vision and the location of my property would, are really actually really important attributes. Location, location, location when they say in real estate. And I agree with Ken and, uh, and Lindsay um, and Joan and their comments. I think everyone's right dead on. I don't think anyone's in disagreement. We're on the right track. Just, we need more time. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Steve? Steve Crawford, private citizen comment, not related to schools, as, <laughs> but rather than talking and working with WASTA to make artistic concrete walls, you might consider glass or other transparent sound attenuation walls along the freeway and things that would maintain a transparency between people driving along the roadway and the mountains and hillsides around and the aesthetics that you're trying to maintain in Issaquah rather than creating a concrete valley. Thanks, Steve. Anybody else? Yeah, Vicki. Vicki Hunt, PPC. I will make one quick comment. Um, so I think that I personally do like the structure of having the actions and then follow through to the measures of success, but I think then, especially through the lens of having um, developers and it be an obligation, not, um, not and, and specific and then also backed up with code. I do think we need to refine and wordsmith. And I think especially through that lens, not all of the um, not all of the obligations may apply to all the developers. And so I think we also need to be specific about what we mean by different things or how or how it would apply in different situations. Because um, I think some of them would be confusing for smaller developers or developers that aren't um, in the specific situations that have been mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Steve? All right, so thanks to the PPC, I think, for volunteering to go over it again. I think that's a good plus uh, to all the folks involved with that. Uh, there was a motion that was made at the last PPC to bring in some consultation work. I think that word is, word is worth being considering, not to dismiss the staff's work or the time or the effort all they've done. I just don't know that we have the right language that we want to say to incorporate in that. Uh, 
I don't know that we have the experiences, the average person or PPC to incorporate that. So um, just wanted to give a plug for that as well. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay. Seeing none. So, um, a couple thoughts come to mind. Um, we can um, look at um, potentially making a decision at this point about where to go next, and that might inform us what our next steps would be. Um, so, the, I think the offer on the table from PPC is um, that, you know, give it back to us and we'll, we'll do some more work on it. Um, and as Lindsay said, I've heard a lot of comments from us about the first um, the neighborhood um, sub area, sub district, and um, if we wanted to go through the rest of them at a little bit higher level, maybe if we have other comments, maybe that would finish out our comments and then it goes back. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm not wanting to limit your comments. Just feedback on where you want to go from here and how much more time you want to spend on it tonight, if indeed you wanted to go back for more. I think we've had a consistent um, message from the folks here. Um, I'm in favor of more work on it. Yeah, I want to get it done, and I want to get it done good, and I think it that's the route. Mm -hmm. It's not just us tonight and then and later sure. on this month. That's not the way to get it done good. Sure. Mary Lou, you might miss an opportunity to be part of the final. Hmm. Final. True. That would be sad. Actually, she probably would get to read it before the final <laughs> product goes out to anyone in an agenda bill <laughs> or I, in, a, in the next version. True. I agree with the two of you, um, but I wanted to um, say something up front to staff first. This is dramatically better yeah. than what we had in the original plan, and it is totally headed in the right direction. I think the structure of what you've done is great. So I'm really optimistic that there isn't a lot of work more to do. But I don't have enough comfort level right now to say that, that we got there tonight and that we're ready to pass this on. I just wanted to make a comment a couple of people have said about hiring a consultant. I think we have um, awesome talent and voices on planning policy, other community members are coming in, and on staff. I would suggest maybe we need an editor. You know, that not a consultant to come in and tell us, this is how we did it in other towns and this is how you should do it. I think we know what we want, but I would agree some of the word choice could be better. And that's something that a professional editor might be able to add at the end when we think we're close to be done. But I think we have the right team here to do it. I like your idea about going and quickly giving some other um, direction, either generally about what we saw or specifically about the neighborhood. So I'd like to, I think we should do that as well. I guess my only, so I, I too heard the motion um, that was made that didn't get a second at PPC about hiring a consultant. Um, and I didn't agree at the time be, with that motion that was made. I wasn't on PPC, so it doesn't matter, but I was watching. <laughs> and I didn't agree because if I was gonna hire a consultant, I think I would spend that money on helping us with the code because I, th I think that's where we might need some help. Um, if we are being told, and if we are thinking about making these developer obligations the code, that, um, then I'm not opposed to having the draft final product be reviewed by somebody who's worked with us on a moratorium, item, moratorium items to see if they have any um, concerns or advice or suggestions of things we might might be missing, we should consider because th because that is super important. If if we're now thinking that that's our link to getting this into code, then I I would I wouldn't be opposed to having a one of the consultants that was has worked with us. Got it. But that's, you don't have to decide tonight. Okay. 
I can't tell if you want to say anything. Well, You're earlier I had suggested me. as well, and I appreciate uh, Skip making some comments. I do. Uh, the, so, the party, not we only heard from one person who represents development, but the, but this is, they're the other part. Their partner. It's it's going to be through their investment and the work that they do to get these those obligations. And I, and I just, I would very, I would very much value having that lens part of this conversation as well. Um, I mean, and it's, I, I view it as a partnership. I think that opportunity to, to at least an invitation for more people from the development community to offer their um, feedback, I would welcome that. You know, one of the other exercises that we went through was the practice exercise, was it with the architectural fit and urban design? Um, it would be interesting to know if you took a, one of the projects that was on the ground, maybe a larger one and a smaller one, and um, reprocess that project with this, with the draft in place, what happens? Okay, let's finish up with our comments so that um, we can hand this back and then let's... Uh, I could do some high level sure. five and four. I think dividing it into four or fewer areas was a very good idea. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think the code bridge that is what I would say that last slide that you showed us, um, Keith, was good, um, except it needs to be tighter. And out of that, we may feel that there are one or two other pieces that need to be added, like a more specific green necklace description. Um, I mentioned this earlier in the day to Keith. I believe the confluence area is not, uh, it is a tough one to work on. And at this point in time, I think it should come out of the plan and be identified in the central square plan as a future consideration to be added. I don't think it fits in. I don't think it belongs, and I'm not really sure what redevelopment in that area would look like. The East Lake Edge, I agreed with the comments at PPC um, from Connie, particularly with the properties to the Northeast. It goes up hillsides, it goes up roads, it goes into all kinds of funny places that it doesn't in the rest of Issaquah. For example, there's a townhouse area up behind um, Value Village that is is built out yet it's it's in here is is the expectation that that would be you know removed and turned there there's odd edges on that side that don't seem to make sense to me I see density on the valley floor and and adding where we have current parking lots but that whole eastern edge is it's a weird collection of odd things and I'm not sure I understand why the boundary isn't just the flat parcels all along East Lake Sammamish Parkway. Um, I actually like the name Regional Growth Center. Uh, I think the, the areas that I have the most confidence in, and it is because of what Skip said, is the large parcels, Raleigh and Costco. I just am so comfortable with what it could happen in there. I can, I can really picture it. Uh, I think the Western Gateway needs a new name, and I think the community should pick it. <laughs> um, and I agree with taking the area identified as old Highway 10 out and that it is a really, could be, it is a cool part of town and it could be really cool, but not in a central Issaquah way. It doesn't fit in with that character. And as I got to the end of listening to PPC and reading through the documents tonight, I put on both hats. One, I'm a citizen. I want to read this because I want to understand what they're doing down there. And two, I'm a user. I'm a, I'm a builder. I own two acres. What am I going to do with it? And I, I think it should be for both. But I don't know if it works for both yet. And I'm not sure if you're intending it to work for both or it's more for community or more for builder. but. It's not quite there for either one yet. It needs to be there for both. Um, Actually, I have one more general comment Sure. over the whole thing. I'm still concerned that we will get the unintended content consequence of displacement, meaning we will chew away at the foundation we already have of retail or professional office to cater to a current market that wants to build storage units, hotels, and apartment buildings. And I'm not sure how to fix that. I might be as people dive into those neighborhoods that are currently professional office, which is a little pieces here and there, but 
I don't think we should be stay, taking a step back. And to me, tearing down an office building, uh, or in the case of Atlas, taking out a retail center, which may not have been our most prominent, uh, well-visited retail center, but we lost something to get something else. So I don't want to trade off. And I'm not sure how you accommodate that in those districts that have professional office now or warehousing or whatever they have. Uh, so, was the RGC in this new one, the Issaquah Valley? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the new okay. one. Okay. So, I don't care for RGC, and I, for all oh, the reasons that PPC was saying, um, uh, it's a growth designation that's yuck. Um, yuck. Not sure I like Issaquah Valley either, because Issaquah Valley is the entire valley. So. I don't know, Central Valley, I, I just would, and I think the names are important because we're trying to create distinct places, so let's be thoughtful about it. I agree with the comments, um, I don't know where they came from, maybe Connie, that Pickering and Gilman need their own boxes um, because this kind of is all one thing. They need to be separated out if you wanna try to make them, if you're gonna have two, they need to be, just, distinct, their own distinct boxes. Um, yeah, East Lake should be two words. Um, I have a concern in the Issaquah Valley one where we somehow have identified that that's where the sound transit is going to be, sound transit station is going to be located. I don't know that we've gone, have we gone through that exercise? No. No, we have not. So um, if it's, if we want to suggest that that might. Your concern is too definitive? Well, yeah, this is going to be policy. This, right. this, this is a policy document. Right. Yeah. So um, we have not made that decision, which needs to absolutely involve the entire community in that decision. Uh, confluence. So the definition of confluence is the joining of two rivers. Um, and so not sure I'm super fond, we have Confluence Park, but not sure I'm super fond of this Confluence sub-district because um, it says this neighborhood serves as a confluence of Central Issaquah and Old Town. Um, I think it, I just don't think that's the right word. Um, hmm. Somebody mentioned that they wanted a rock star document. Well, I do too, but I want a rock star code because that's important. <laughs> Um, Connie sent an email and she, one of her comments was create code link, create a code language workbook for each neighborhood to allow um, development commission and staff to easily implement the visions. So um, given what we've talked about tonight, if we're really going to do the, that these developer obligations um, would be code, then um, that should be maybe looked at as the code language workbook. I think that um, we can look at it that way. Um, that's all I have right now. Thanks. And I echo Mary Lou's comments about how dramatically improved this is. Um, mm -hmm. So I understand y'all want it off your plate, and it sounds like maybe we don't think it's dramatically improved, and that's not true. I think this, the sentiment is that um, four years ago, there was pressure to get it passed, and it wasn't done, and um, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to, um, I don't feel like I need to do that again just not gonna do it again. And so the fact that it's not ready is just is what it is. It's not because it's a bad, it's because we are in the process of making it um, really, really good. And I think we're really close. Thank you, I have a number of comments. Uh, my electronic form of the document has got a lot of annotations, I will send them along. I don't need to mention them all. The reduction in the number of uh, districts, if I may just call it that, I do support. Um, I was sad to see the, lose the name Tibbetts, but Gilman's not a bad change. 
So the, I, I think the idea, though they, they share a lot in common because they are within our regional growth center, um, I think it's okay because we have a global 60 company sitting north of the highway. And that by definition changes that neighborhood from others. And, and as, as well as having, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna point out as well too, you gave us that little visual exercise earlier traveling eastbound on I-90. On I you failed to mention if you're looking straight ahead, you're gonna be seeing Costco buildings. And, then, mm -hmm. and, and so that is, there's more, just can't be too skewed to, you know, the whole experience will be greater than that. So the, uh, um, um, so I'm just gonna quickly go through some of the uh, very, some of my embedded comments, uh, ones that I wanna highlight, and I've already mentioned a couple of them. Um, I did find it a little bit surprising in the future of the Pickering area that it is pedestrian oriented. I thought, wow, that seems to divine that the Costco warehouse is gone. And I, I'm not sure if that was the intent. Um, I know pedestrian oriented walkable is key, but that is going to remain a regional um, business I'm not sure the warehouse, I, I, I'm not sure we should play with the notion yet that retail is gonna change to the extent that the Costco re, um, warehouse is gonna be gone. And I don't think that was the intent. Uh, I don't even wanna suggest it actually in here, uh, but um, that's what jumped out at me when I saw that phrase. Um, interesting comment in here about the commercial and retail employment create a daytime vibrancy. I wasn't sure how that was different than it is what we were talking about today. And there's also a comment in there about this, uh, rather than feeling urban, I, I, don't, I don't understand that comment, rather than feeling urban. Um, in the future vision for the uh, Gilman area, the, the neighborhood is the heart of modern Issaquah. Well, that's an interesting comment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna caution all of us about using the word heart to describe any part of Issaquah that isn't part of an established part of Issaquah today. Uh, I think there is a certain um, heart to Issaquah and I, 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 I don't, and if by modern Issaquah you mean something different, um, think about that sentence. Um, um, I think in that, that area as well, in Gilman, it says the inhabitants in this area share the fulfillment of their daily needs with the single family residents on Squawk and Cougar Mountains. And everybody else in the region, if they wanna come use our retail. And the other people who live in parts of the uh, Issaquah as well. I think that is, if you wanna believe that that's, you felt it so important to mention single family residential on Squawk and Cougar Mountains, I think we're fooling, that would be a mistake. Um, there's still a pretty significant retail uh, um, component to the Gilman area. Um, we've talked about, you know, if they were gonna get outside of Costco increased employment, it's gonna happen in that regional center. Uh, and this idea that, um, I just I thought that was an odd sentence to, to kind of limit that because I think we were limiting what's actually gonna happen. There's gonna be people coming in and out of Gilman from all areas. Every place you mention WashDOT, it's really state leaders. It's, it, it, WashDOT doesn't do, WashDOT does what the legislature and the feds tell them to. So they're an enabling agent, but we're talking, if, if this is a policy document, this is about, you know, just, just uh, for example, um, you know, incorporate noise reduction measures. It's not just WashDOT. We're, we're talking about, uh, making sure that's clear on our own regional agenda, and we know who we need to speak with and influence, and it's and it's going to be the legislators who create projects, packages, and get them funded, because uh, noise attenuation happens when they go and do make a change to the corridor. Oh, okay, now there's federal standards that say they have to they have to try to measure whether or not um, they need to do some noise abatement. Um, projects like that don't just come from WashDOT. So I, I, I think that's just a, something to keep in mind. I do agree, I, I have little, um, I realize there hasn't been a wider neighborhood conversation about the location of the Sound Transit train station. Um, I would expect it's gonna be somewhere in what's called the Issaquah Valley District.
have a few more. Totally did not understand some of the, and I'm gonna send some along, I'll highlight this one, some of the measures of success, especially for Issaquah Valley area. Pickering borrowing evolves into an all-round community asset. See. Gonna get a pool there or something? I'm not really sure what that, what that meant. And all the comments about Gilman Village, um, of course that's privately owned today, and I know there's a desire among many that somehow that, that place within Issaquah is retained. And it's gonna take a lot more than us just wishing that. And, and so I, I think this is, that's an interesting topic by itself. Um, privately owned, in the central area, I don't know, what we, through policy or code, um, I don't think we can. I think we have to go beyond um, any of those tools. So uh, I would like to have a little bit more discussion, and, and if we can publicly, I don't know, uh, about all this this um, intent, spoken intent to retain Gilman Village, Gilman Village, and how do we achieve that? Okay, I'm almost done. I think an ex I'm gonna use an exam, I'm gonna use wayfinding as an example of one of those uh, attributes that really needs to be everywhere. And again, at the LTAC, at the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee, uh, the use of some of those resources to design and then um, work with other providers to, to actually uh, get wayfinding throughout the city. I think that's a good example, one that just permeates all of the, it's just one example. It's part of all of the districts and neighborhoods. I did find in, there's multiple, uh, where it mentions, uh, Specifically, city implementation actions work with property owner to revegetate, re revegetate, excuse me, hillside and replace existing black nugget wall. Revegetate hillside. Is there something about that I don't know? Is I, is I understand that that isn't that a parcel that could still be developed? It's interesting. Okay, so we want to revegetate that. Okay, it makes sense, but um, we don't own it. Okay. And I also found the con the uh, some of the couple comments in there about regional traffic impacts on East Lake Sammamish Parkway and 56 are better man managed. Um, I wonder if we really, do we mean all regional traffic or are we talking about pass-through traffic? Because some of our regional traffic are those that come to shop at our, re at our retail centers. Um, and, and I don't think our intention is to somehow manage that differently. I think our impact comes from pass-through traffic and if that's what we refer to, then I think we should name that. So I will be summarizing some of those, those and some other comments and sending them along, thank you. Uh, that's it, I wasn't planning on doing another round of comments um, since it looks like this is going back and we'll have more feedback from, PPC will talk amongst themselves and they can have public comment and then it'll be back. So, um, what, what, um, we just, do we, let me look at the agenda bill so that we don't, what does it say? It has to go back to council on the 18th. Okay, so it goes back to the council on the 18th and then this committee would recommend that it be referred back to PPC and then to land and shore and then back to the council, mm -hmm. is that right? Um, 
and then it will be helpful for the 18th because the moratorium hearing is on the 18th for there to be um, in this agenda bill a proposed schedule with dates so the council can decide what to do about um, the moratorium. Okay. Okay. All right. Anything else on this topic you guys can think of? No? All right. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. PPC, task force members, general public, Steve Crawford. What? Oh. No. And staff on this topic. We do have one more agenda item. Just, well, I'm just assuming that everybody but Arthur, Trish and Arthur, are going to leave. <laughs> Not everybody. But. All right, thank you so much. Oh, what? You brought sorbet? Yeah, I would, that, that would have been a really good idea. <laughs> okay, the last item on our agenda, Agenda Bill 7507, amendments to the Issaquah Municipal Code and Central Issaquah standards regarding inclusionary zoning requirements for Central Issaquah. Um, you, you all, I'm Trish Hanonen from DSD. You all saw this at your meeting in November as a sort of a preliminary. Uh, you didn't have the agenda bill yet, but this is the um, implementation, if you will, of the first implementation of the housing strategy that you all approved earlier this year. Um, this is number six, that's the developer required um, affordable housing. And tonight we're gonna just generally remind you what we're trying to accomplish, talk about how far we can push the element of the requirement and how many units might we get as the plan unfolds and to find out if you have additional questions. Um, according to the state law, we are allowed to do this, which is really helpful to know. Um, but the one thing that it tells us is if we're gonna require inclusionary zoning, we have to give something back to the applicant as well. Um, that's sort of the translation in the second paragraph there, that we have to get something. Uh, it's usually some sort of an up zone or, or either more height or more um, FAR. Uh, floor area ratio is how it's defined. Um, in Issaquah, those are the two things that um, we felt we could give, and we felt that height doesn't seem to be a really um, palatable, if you will, um, give to a developer these days, so we thought the FAR was a lot easier um, to palate, to exchange for affordable housing. Um, the three places that were um, either increasing or adding um, inclusionary zoning is the yellow is the vertical mixed use that you all also just approved this year. Um, that'll be in a, a different requirement. The core already has 10%, but we would be proposing to increase that. And the mixed use area, the purple, would um, get a new requirement of inclusionary zoning. This, this is the magical way that we figured out that it was legally defensible. I'm sure you all had fun with these charts. Um, and we can go over them in detail if, if your head wouldn't explode. Um, this, there's three of them. There's, I'm just gonna pass through them until someone tells me to stop. The vertical mixed use, um, the, um, the not vertical mixed use, that's the urban core, and the outside the urban core, which was the purple area, that's the mixed juice. Those are how we got to what we could require. And also how we got to, some of it's a, a smaller percentage, but it's more of a lower income. Um, so they balance well, so the applicant still has the same payout, but to give them choices, it might help them uh, with the product that they build. So that's why some of them have two different choices of what they can build. How many affordable units could we get? Um, this was just a math problem. Um, the current code, all we could get would be 10% of the core, not including Rowley. Um, and we would get perhaps 700, 700 units because of the 10%. In the proposed code in the core, without being in Rowley and without being in vertical mixed use, we could get more than that many, just all by itself, just to go up to 12%. 
Also with the vertical mixed use, we'd add another 130 approximately, and the mixed use we would get 50. And that's just a, um, oh sorry, just a, a raw calculation, acres versus how many, um, you know, with the height and all that. So it's, it's rough, but it shows you that we would be getting a lot more than we would with just the core at 10%. There are questions on? on that little bit of math? Not on that table, Trish, but we are giving them, in the other tables you showed, we are giving them, um, what is their get? What is, it's a higher FAR? It's, it's, a, um, it's a higher base height, because we're not, we're not giving up the density bonus. If they want to go above what they have now, they still have to do all the requirements of the density bonus. What we're giving them is more entitlement within their, the by raising the base height. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the, the more value we're giving them to provide more affordability in, in that base height. So are we Which, changing building form? Are they going from wood frame to steel? Like are we sure that what we're creating is, an, is what they want? Or is it going to have a chilling effect, meaning we've, we're putting them into a model that they, that's more expensive and so that may take a longer time to come to town. I haven't heard that that's the case, okay. but I'll let our economic developer <laughs> so speak to that. So can you go to the table, Trish, that shows the code changes? Um, I don't think that was in your slideshow. It was not in my slideshow, but it's in the agenda <laughs> packet. It's in the, it's in the agenda packet, let me. You need it if I'm gonna talk. Right, <laughs> I gotta get to the escape. Um, There's no agenda packet? So right now, um, what we're saying is we're increasing the base height to 60 feet in the core and in the mixed use zone. So 60 feet is five stories. Mm -hmm. um, so that's wood frame still. Okay. And the building community has told us that that's a get for a give, meaning they're excited about the fact that they can go to five stories. And it'll pencil out with a pro forma where they have to give us between seven and a half and twelve percent of. Like they're saying, this is it. Now we'll come and build. Or I just think in terms of the core that yes. nobody's built in the core yet. Yes. And so, and our density bonus didn't turn out to be much right. of an incentive. Is this an incentive to no. get? No. Okay. No, absolutely not. Okay. No, this is not. So I mean, gonna, so so we're increasing build? the we're increasing the height, and we're also increasing the FAR in the core. It's going from 1.7 to 3, so that's a big difference actually. And then um, in the mixed use, it's going from 1.7 to 2.5. Do you want to talk? Arthur wants to talk too. You can either come sit at the table, Arthur, or go up to lecture in either way. And I'm not worried about incenting or not incenting. Are they going to come and build if we give them these new numbers? Is this exciting to the building community? Like, yay, we got this, and so now we'll come and we can meet that affordable owner. Or is it have a chilling So effect? I'm going to, I'll let, I'm sure Arthur will have an opinion on this too. My opinion would be that your obligation for the increase in inclusionary will mean that either, it, so if the market's not there now, um, it will take longer for them to do that. So, but where we had this disproportion before, where we had inclusionary in the core and nothing on the mixed use, right. now it's everywhere. So there's not an incentive necessarily to pick, say, over by Fred Meyer okay. and, and not do the core. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's part of the answer. Um, another part of the answer is that the methodology, I, I think you could, if you brought in different builders, you'd hear different things. Different builders look at the world differently. The methodology we use to come up with these figures is the same methodology we've been using with all the other cities on the east side. Sometimes plans are five years ahead of the market. I think the best I can tell you is look at what's happening in other communities on the east side, Sammamish Town Center. They're getting housing built up there now with a mandatory requirement. Numbers are a little different, but the methodology we use to try to evaluate what would be reasonable rates uh, is about the same. I think that one of the things you are seeing is builders generally um, 
aren't building, you know, you want structured parking, and once you go to that, they're gonna wanna go to 60 feet. So if you look at most of the buildings being built in your other cities on the east side, this is a profile that's very common and standard for what the builders are trying to do. Um, so from those different points of view, you can't always predict exactly when things will happen, um, but I think the methodology that we're using here is very similar to other communities and the building types you have here are similar to what you are seeing being built elsewhere on East King County. That was, was it? that was the presentation. Do you have other questions about other parts of it? Um, I don't have questions, I have a comment. Um, and that is that um, I have a hard time visualizing how this works. Um, and similar to what I suggested regarding the visions, um, it would be helpful for me to see um, a, how this works. So a, a project that had already been approved, um, what, how would using this code, how would this exclusionary zoning, how would that have changed that project? Um, visually as well as numbers? Both, are you having trouble thinking of the numbers or it's seeing how it would look? Mass. Yeah, the and, okay. and the numbers. Yeah, I mean. So numbers in what way? Well, in the number of housing units or? Yeah, I think so. I just, I don't, I'm having a hard time just totally getting it, sorry. Okay, uh, you know, I think what we can do is give you some examples of some projects at different FARs mm -hmm. and at different heights. Okay. Um, assuming that, and, and if we're lucky, we can find them on similar sized properties so you can really see an apple to apple comparison. Um, so we'll see what we can do in terms of finding projects to show you in terms of density. Because um, I think the issue is, um, you know, obviously, what, what you don't know is, okay, so you've got, right now, you've got basically a, a four-story a four story allowance with no inclusionary requirement, and you could get a project there, assuming you lift the moratorium tomorrow, uh, versus a five-story project with a certain number of affordable housing units in it. So it's gonna look different, right? Um, and so I guess, um, but it doesn't, you know, but there's no, just because you've increased the FAR and the building height does not necessarily mean that a developer will build to that maximum envelope. You know, that's part of the problem is, you know, a developer will choose how tall his building wants to be and how much he wants to push the FAR because that's going to drive a parking requirement. So it's all, there's all these kind of tethered pieces that, you know, and that's why Arthur said different developers will give you different answers because they all put their projects together a little bit differently. So I think if, if what you're trying to visualize is how the mass changes, I think we can do some examples of how going from 40 to 60 and going from an FAR of 1.7 to an FAR of two and a half and three, changes on a block diagram of what those blocks might look like. Um, but I don't know, I mean, I guess I don't well, if know. if I'm the only one who doesn't get it, then oh, no, I don't want to hold it. A visual. I don't want to hold it back, so I don't know if, I mean, I don't think I could go out to somebody, I know I couldn't go out to somebody and describe what this does. And part of what I understood, the motivation, and I'll, I'll give this story of Redmond to sort of correlate what Keith was just saying, is that Redmond allowed build, they changed their height way back in the mid 90s um, and they increased their height significantly. And that first wave of new buildings, you had three stories, you had four stories, you had a two story, they, they were all building it different, but what, through their rules, every building had affordability. 
And that's sort of what you're accomplishing here. Every building, no matter what form they form, they will now have affordability where before they had to, trip, they had to get triggered by if they went to a certain height. Um, but what Redmond found is not everybody went to that maximum allowed because of market today, you go to downtown Redmond, the buildings look pretty differently than they did the first five years. Um, same when you go to downtown Bellevue. Look at the stuff, it's high rises now. It wasn't the first 10 years. The zoning didn't change all that much. So that's why it's hard to say exactly what will get built. But what this does do is it does increase the base, but it's still within the maximums you had allowed under your zoning, where you haven't changed any of the maximums. Mm -hmm. And it does guarantee that all properties will have some level of affordability through these provisions. Sure. So, um, for both of you, the FAR for Atlas is two it's, or less than two? It's less than it's, two. Yeah, it's yeah. less than two. It seems like, I want to say it's Because it's, it's, it's a big site. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a big site. Right. Um, so that's helpful, too, just reminding us of the size of the buildings that are there. But I, if I understand you correctly, Arthur, we gave them the ability to go up to an FAR of right. three. But even if they do an FAR of, of what Atlas did, 1.9, they still right. have to give us affordability. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Trish, you had a slide earlier, I think, that had the different um, areas. It was a table, not the picture. There's the urban core, mixed use, and then the percentages of required. That one? Oh, yeah, you were there. Uh, you were it's there. like five, six, oh. and seven, Trish. Oh, in the, the magic no, no. tables? Oh. No, 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 not those. <laughs> five, six, and seven, the map. No, 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 you were there. Go back down to eight. Go eight, back to which one? Eight, eight. Oh, sorry. Okay. This from current slide. Okay. Alt X at. And what's the question? Just getting there? <laughs> well, yeah, I think there. That's all I wanted to Thanks. see if you could do that. No. It was harder. <laughs> it's harder than yeah, that. Yeah, no. Time to go. Uh, so I looked at this when you presented it this way, and I saw, okay. Um, Over what we have today in the core, we'd get, we could get up to 40 more units. Over what we get today in the VIX, uh, vertical mixed use area, we, we could get up to 130 more units. Over in the uh, mixed use area, over what we have today, we could get up to 50 more units. Um, and um, with the, in the second to the right column being, okay, it, 12% has to be affordable, 15% has to be affordable, 7.5% has to be affordable. Um, I mean, that to me, right there, with the, ex with the exception of not identifying in this slide what affordable levels, the levels of affordability, mm -hmm. this is what we were talking about, is, mm -hmm. it is like, okay, if we're gonna do inclusionary, we're talking about getting more affordable housing units than we would get today. Um, it's, this model is about 220 above. Um, again, this is the, those and those are maximum numbers. So to me, the question, um, I don't have any problem with this. I, I, I did kind of wonder, okay, is, I guess, I, and before now I hadn't thought about, well, what, what, what number do I want? Well, I guess I really don't, it's, I have to do it in terms of a percent. I feel like, I feel like we have to do it. You've worked out the math, you've given us a percent. Um, so I, so I, I don't, can, can you just at least speak to the levels of affordability? And then for, to me, that'll be a complete picture. I have a slide. Because um, <laughs> I knew I couldn't remember it off my time in my head. Um, from the urban core, we went 10 was mid-moderate. That was what the standards were adopted as. But now mm -hmm. there's a choice for an applicant. They can go 12.5 low or low moderate or 10 low, and I've got the definitions on the next slide if you want to know what those are. No, that's okay. I'm the low moderate that. is yeah. the new mm -hmm. one that we're proposing mm -hmm. that's 60%, is that right? right? The low moderate the low? is 60%. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. and then the, the uh, for vertical mixed use, again, the, they have a choice of um, with 15%, mid. 10 is mid, five is low, or they can yeah. go 10 all low, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is kind of the same price point for them, but it gives us a different, um, and the, for um, mixed use residential, it's 7.5 mid moderate or five low moderate. Okay, then could you flip to where you have the definitions? Oh. 
Okay. And the one underlined is the only new one. Is it too small? <laughs> I'm just looking for 60, 70, 80. Oh, and it's in your packet too. Yeah. Pardon? Um, in the actual, oh, in the magic tables? Um, which one were you interested in? The Which one? Right. I wanted to see it in summary. Oh. We just provided it. Thanks, Lindsay. I think okay. part of this is, you know, remembering we have nine strategies that we identified as, as initial ways to get more affordable housing. This is, there's no silver bullet, right? This, in, you know, I think we all looked at these numbers and said, I wish they'd be more. Um, but they really are, unless we're really ready to upzone Central Issaquah dramatically, I think this is as far as we could push the, the needle. This one, right? So, Arthur. Earlier, you talked about the methodology, and I and I think you're referring to how you came to that five or seven and a half percent, and that ten or that fifteen percent. Right. Could you just speak to that a little bit for me, please? Right. So what we have to acknowledge is that right now, in two of your, I'm going to go to one of the summary charts. What, what did I just do? <laughs> Nothing. Just go page up. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. That was the last slide. Is that I want to go back to that one slide you were showing? Um, no, that's close enough, I guess. So, what we have to acknowledge is that in the core in the VMU, you have a 10% requirement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and what we did, and so we could use that, and then when we added more, we could take the value of that increase. Mm -hmm. above your baseline, and that's how we were able to get above 10%, okay? So we, and we could also get to those lower affordability levels, because that was one of the other things we pointed out in the last meeting, is you're, also, you're not getting them all at 70, you're getting them at 50, 60, or 70, mm -hmm. you're getting a, a mixture. So, um, but in the manufacturer area, we can't take anything for the base you have today, because there's no requirement today. We could only look at the increment you give and we had to distribute, and so when we did the math on how much we could ask of that, then we had to distribute it amongst the base plus the increase. So that's why it's a much smaller percentage for the MU, is because you only have the value of the increase above the existing base to the new base to work with. Whereas with the other two areas, you had the existing base affordability plus some portion of the increase to the new base. And, and that's the math we were doing. Okay, so you worked within the kind of the height restrictions that we already had within Correct. each of these areas. We didn't give new height. Of course, we right. still have the density bonus that's available to them. Right. But 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 right. the additional value came in and, and is but increasing the base. By making it a new base, it allowed us to say we want something for giving you that new base. Mm -hmm. And for each zone, it's a little different because in the two in the core, you gave a little bit different amounts. That's why the numbers aren't the same for both core and VMU. One you gave more height and more FAR, and one we only gave a little more height and FAR. Um, and then with the MU, we- Excuse me, we did or you were or proposing? The proposal, the proposal that's in front of you is to do different amounts of increases to the base for the VMU mm -hmm. and the core. And then with the manufacturer, because that's the outline area, that was a smaller increase as well. So, and again, that's, if you wanted to change any of those increases to the base, we'd have to go back and look at the percentages again. Sorry. <laughs> and you're done. Yeah. So, Arthur, going back to that chart, my understanding is that when you get to those lower um, uh, affordability numbers, that for just a market rate project, mm -hmm. it makes it hard for them to want to put together a, or makes it difficult for them to put to perform it together unless they're building a lot more units. My question is, I don't want to discourage them from even building two or three story buildings, mm -hmm. but with that level of affordability and without them getting any sort of other federal grants or tax credits or partners, is this still buildable? I'm Right now, this year, there are 350, no, 
200, uh, what's the number we're at? In East King County cities, there are approaching 290 new affordable units through land use incentives and the sizes of one or two affordable units in one development to 30 plus in other developments. Um, last year there were 200, the year before 200, um, and the number of affordable units is all over the map depending on the size of the buildings. But are they getting as low as the numbers we're proposing here? Or are we are we setting the bar in a way where we might discourage and not be competitive to get these kinds of developments? I'm not. I'm not. I think the factors that are more relevant is the market overall, because 90% of the units are market rate. And one of the reasons we took this approach here, one of the things we have heard from builders actually is they sometimes prefer to do fewer affordable units even if they have to be more affordable. So Redmond has, just like you have, they have the same program, but they go, you can do 10% at 80 or 5% at 50% of median. Some have chosen the 5% at 50. And some of most, it's, it's mixed. Different, it's, and it seems, you know, right now we have a couple builders who are choosing that and some are choosing the 80%. So that's one reason we like, I think it's nice to have that choice is because different builders have different philosophies of what makes sense to them. Thanks. Other questions? Ready for, is, do you have anything else, Trish? No, I was just gonna be ready for your motion. Okay, so I'm gonna. Public. Yeah, I'll offer public comment. Okay. Come on. <laughs> it's only 10. Oh, it's 10. Okay, there's 10. no public comment. Oh. Public comment. Shoot. Let's see, well, <laughs> you should do it. There we go. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. What's your pleasure? I, I'm excited that we're doing it. We're doing it everywhere. I think that's great. Where I'm a little bit confused is, you know, Arthur had said there's a lot of examples of what, it, they use the same form or method. method. Mm -hmm. They use the same method for us. Um, I guess I want, I would like to know what other cities are actually building now and if they're building at the 60 and how many, If because if we put that number that low, are we going to, are we going to not going to get it? I don't know. A little uncertain about that. Can I? Redmond Kirkland has done something like you're doing with the site with the MFTE. They require new developments to have 10% at 50% of median. You ever been to downtown Kirkland lately? Mm -hmm. That new big, big building has 10% at 50. Um, other cities. Um, Redmond has mostly at 80%, but they have some at 50, um, and they're doing a new area at 70. Um, Sammamish, I think, is at 80 for rental. You know, they're the same for everybody. Um, Newcastle, I believe, is 70% of median for rental um, at 10% or more. I think it's 10%. Um, so we are seeing a range of affordability levels and a range of percentages out in the community and it's sort of, that's why I mentioned the methodology is right. trying and, and why I think I said just having that choice for a smaller percentage, I'm surprised at how many builders in Redmond, because their math implies you do the, going from 10 at 80 to five at 50 doesn't make all the, that doesn't add up numerically, but builders choose it. So different builders have different things they're looking at. I think this satisfies our objective to get into code the requirement for affordable housing. Um, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I do know that this, from a housing perspective, that um, as Arthur said, um, there is a market 90 or 92 and a half or 88 percent or 85 percent is going to be market rate. And um, you know, these are, I, I accept this recommendation from our experts. 
uh, and I'd like to see us go forward with this. You too. Ten. Yeah. Right. Eighteenth. Yeah. Shit. Um. Regular business. Eighteenth. Before the last item. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Jen. Oh, goodness. Okay. If there's nothing else you need from us, then we're adjourned. Okay.